spooky tunes, yes indeed. Oh, shoot, I spoke. Now everyone knows that I'm here. Dang it. Well, anyway, hey, hi, hello, how's everyone doing? Let me just turn that down real quick. Yeah, so welcome back, everyone. Last week, we delved into, uh... One of my new favorite stories, honestly, to come from the internet. Um, the Mystery Flesh Pit National Park. Like, genuinely, I really like this story a lot. I think it's super cool. And, uh, yeah, uh, last week we started it, and we got a pretty decent chunk of the way into it. But, good lord, there is a lot to read, and... Uh, well, we might as well get started. I have with me... Uh, good. Uh, I want to say like the half gallon of water. That should do me fine. Yeah, I figured uh, last stream the beginning was missing a little something, so I decided to uh, cue up a little bit of Halloweeny music. Now, normally I would have played something like Hilltop Mausoleum from Medieval, but Sony likes to take that, like take all the Medieval soundtrack down. So, uh, it is what it is. So we had to go with the next best thing, Mad Monster Mansion from banjo Kazooie, Because Banjo-Kazooie is amazing, and everyone should play it. Anyway, that's enough of that. We have a nice ambience here. And uh, one thing I should say that is a little bit of a problem when it comes to the Mystery Flesh Pit Tumblr page is that for whatever reason... Uh, it resets its layout. It Like a lot of different websites, it randomizes what it presents you with first. So uh, we're going to have to scroll through all of this. Now, I don't exactly remember all the stuff that we've read. Like, I remember we looked at this, we looked at this, we definitely looked at this and this. Do we look at Aberrant Alarm, though? Let's go ahead and take a look. Aberrant Alarm. This is a sign from inside of the Mystery Flash Pit. Aberrant Alarm. If this emergency light is blinking, cryptic phenomena have been reported in the area. Never enter a work site with high occult activity. You know, we did read that. We absolutely did read that. I don't remember, to be honest. If only Pat were here. If only Pat were here. Unfortunately, Pat had to work uh, closing today, so he's not going to be here for a little bit of time because he worked till closing, and then he has to eat, and thankfully he's not eating while he's listening to this because it's just going to immediately come right back up. So um, I'm going to go it alone for a little bit. Let's see. Uh, have we read this? Yes, we have read this. We've read that, we've looked at this, uh, we've looked at that, this, that, that. Actually, yes, we have. We've definitely read this. We read this to an exhausting extent. Uh, we looked at this, 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 this. We looked at that, we looked at that and that. Oh yeah, the gift shop. Uh, this is such a cool thing. Like, I, I love it whenever... ARGs do shit like this because it's it just it's world building and it's really good world building to like to see like a picture of it it's really cool uh let's leave that let's see T -t 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 -t. did we look at this I don't know if we looked at this let's see take it from me bud you can keep a good man down with the right incentives and benefits are you tired of, you know, we have read this. Yeah, this was an advertisement uh, to get people into the mystery flesh pit uh, because they needed uh, workers to go in for the ranger, the park ranger program. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's slacks out of this. I don't think we read this. We definitely didn't read this. We did look at this. Uh, we did look at that. Okay, yeah, okay. I'm starting to remember some of this. Maybe it doesn't randomize the order that it shows you things. Hmm. Anyway. 
Uh, we have the Dallas Morning News, uh, Volume 139, Number 112, uh, Dallas, Texas, on August 9th of 1975. Twelve cents for the paper. Amazing. A mysterious pit and the man who found it. Everybody, please watch your step as you're getting out of the elevator, announced Jim Jackson. Oh, yeah, this is right. This is James Slippin' Jim Jackson. God, what a name. Everybody, please watch your step uh, as you're getting out of the elevator, announced Jim Jackson. The last thing we want is for you to hurt yourself on your first step in. Jim is the first explorer and the head guide of perhaps the strangest natural attraction in the Western Hemisphere, the mystery flesh pit of West Central Texas. We have we had descended what was, must have been several thousand feet down in a great funnel-like pit, the natural opening to the immense organic caverns. It was 10 o'clock in the morning. Upward was a rim of yellow cliffs and a splotch of turquoise sky. Downward was flesh, eternal darkness, and a deep rumbling. Imagine that. You're just gonna casually take an elevator down into the Sarlacc pit. Sup, baby? Hello, Frost. I agree, Frost. Why you pee-pee so big? Upward was sky, and downward we fly. Downward I die. Okay, we had a very similar brainwave. Okay. The elevator gate slid open and the crowd passed onto a metal platform suspended in a great dark organic cavity. The gate closed and was locked with an ominous click. We were severed from the world and our destinies weighed on Slippin' Jim Jackson and his staff of guides. An excursion of wonder and terror, nightmare realms and ghostly monsters, giant arteries, skyscraper muscles, and pits of hell, four hours of which brought us to rest in the huge chambers of the immense organism. We're three miles back and 2,840 feet below the surface, remarked the explorer as, we lit it, as he lit a cigarette that began to softly illuminate his weathered face. Of course, we could go down nearly another 2,000 and maybe keep going, but... And we're three miles back and 2,840 feet below the surface. Oh, you know what? Yeah, this is this is really well done, honestly. Because newspapers do this shit. They'll take, like, a quote and they'll make it big. So that uh, anyone who's looking at the newspaper could go, Oh, that seems interesting. And then they'll pay their... 12 whole hard-earned cents to get the paper. <laughs> Testosterone harvested from a long-dead pharaoh. That's a weird source. Jim James Jackson Jr. Jim Jam James Son! Before we could, before we could finish, an electric arc burst into a vivid white light, like a prolonged flash of lightning between two large transformer terminals. The ozone cloud dissolved, and we saw a mottled ceiling high above, and the restrained, lung-like walls standing far apart. The jolt of electricity concluded, and and once more depressing darkness closed, closed in close around the cluster of lanterns. That is a hard sentence to say. Closed in close around the cluster of lanterns. It's a lot of cuss sounds. A routine delay switching, we were assured. An engineer working nearby... Uh, tells us that routing power down here is quite the puzzle. How did you ever manage to find your way down here? Asked our guide. Me and the, me and the old Ortiz, Jim answered, were swallowed down here using a modified diving bell. Uh, we had it tied off to a platform uh, up top with cables and hoses. By the time we came to a rest, we were here in the gullet. With a powerful flashlight, the path had been pointed out as the great ring like a hole of whoa 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 ring like a hole a hundred feet overhead and several dozen feet in diameter through which the cables and track of the elevator had now been affixed. God, if I'm having difficulty reading now, God help us all. Okay. Uh let's see. Alliteration. Yes, alliteration can be kinda hard. That's why a lot of tongue twisters are alliteration. I find it so odd that it is less taxing on my PC to make a game than it is to run some modern games. It'd be like that sometimes. Uh, da, da, da. Coming, uh, da, da, da. Coming back out, climbing the cable, continued Jim. I was kind of scared for Ortiz, because long towards the top, we slipped. he slipped and got a fistful of some slime. 
uh, we had two ropes hanging side by side. On one, we would pull ourselves up a foot or two at a time, and at the same time, uh, the fellows helping us on top would jerk up the slack in the one that was tied to us. Uh, we made it back out without a scratch. God, I'm having difficulty reading. Jesus. But, he added, before either of us topped out, we were both mighty near... Maybe it's because of the particular way that he speaks. I don't know. But, he added, before either of us topped out, we were both mighty near all in. And if it had been another yard or two, I guess we would have been down here still. James Jackson is not the explorer with the pith helmet, tight-legged pants, and horn-rimmed glasses, but the genuine article of cowboy tradition with an astronaut's flair. There is a difference between the highbrow explorer with money and prestige, a speedsters to fame, and the prowess of the pioneer who blazes the way over new horizons with just nothing save a step that is true and a light in his eye that knows no fear. That was a sense. Jesus Christ. There was no crowd of reporters to hang on Jim's every word. He had failed. Had he failed in his purpose, uh, there would have... I really have to keep the mouse on this so I can read properly. Jesus. Had he failed in his purpose, there would have been none of the soothing ointment of consolation that comes to explorers of position in the shape of victorious defeat when they do not succeed. Had Jim been killed, he would not have been a national martyr uh, in the cause of science, but just a damned fool. He did succeed, though, and the hats are off to him. He was a sturdy, lean figure of a showman's disposition, wearing disposition, wearing a Stetson hat, a suede sports jacket, and tan leather boots. Down in the land of the unreal, of winding organs and gloom, he stood confidently on the fleshy ground in the manner of the men of the range country. And while he deftly rolled cigarettes, he glanced back over the vista of his life and recounted the little concern recounted with little concern experiences that would lay the basis for a great science fiction odyssey this uh, this writer knew uh, it was it was learned that a mining company had conducted extensive operation on reinforcing the develop and developing these sections of the pit so as to make it a habitable habitable uh, place for regular persons said Jim. Uh, two years ago, we lodged the first steel stent into the tissue to build these paths. We never bite off more than we could chew, was their maxim. Only a little at a time did they explore, and when they, and when known landmarks became firmly fixed in mind, they would push on further. Two years ago, we lodged the first steel stent into the tissue to build these paths. In the early part of the visit, we had followed a safe zigzag trail through a gruesome pit, 200 feet deep, aptly called the Septum Falls. The walls were so precipitous and irregular that the uh, first attempts with no trail and without knowing what lay ahead must have been a horror. Uh, that was the hardest part of the whole thing, Jim declared. Finally, I made it across the falls, and before I went on, I made five or six trips across trying to find a better way. We had next followed for several blocks through a colossal hall whose ceilings often rose so high as to be out of range of even the pocket searchlights. The official survey found the height to be about 300 feet, a ceiling high enough under which we could stand a fair-sized skyscraper. Along there, Jim related, uh, we just kind of felt our way as we went. I didn't think much about danger until a mile back we ran across the skeleton of some queer thing, like a sick mermaid or monster, that nearly sourced the whole business with the crew... That nearly soured the whole business with the crew. For a while, at least, I thought I'd cut it all out and say I'd seen enough. But all of a sudden, I just went on and I found Thor's rib cage. What is known as Thor's rib cage was another enormous chasm of ribbed flesh walls, which ebb and flow with some manner of regularity, giving the overall impression of being a chest cavity of this giant being. And for a long time, I thought the rib cage was as far as it went. But one day, while back there, uh, we climbed up a steep wall into that opening and followed it till 
it quit, and there were the pleasure domes. We spent a night or and a part of two days wandering around up there, like being turned loose into a canyon pasture on one long dark night with only these electric torches for lights. During the time we started cutting open these sacks and checking out the goop inside, mighty weird. But how did you keep from getting lost, I asked. With this, Jim replied, taking a bundle of cable line out of his satchel bag. We had to stay tethered to our air supply in those early days, and those tubes and these cables kept us from getting too far from we from wherever we had set up the station. Then I hit on an idea of taking people through the pit to show them the sights, but I never expected to see such a crowd as all of this waving a hand at the throng. Uh, we had entered the bowels of this underworld by a, uh, a tediously long but safe steel passageway. According to many of Jim's staff, this is the way, the way deluxe, as compared with perils of the old trails. Having seen a cat's a cat-sized louse, a cat-sized louse, Jesus, of some kind scamper across a flesh fold and into an orifice, I inquired, "So there is life down here, then?" Yes, and it's just as fantastical as the pit itself. Mighty dangerous, but they skitter uh, easily and don't like to pay us much mind. As Jim said this, he reassuringly patted his hand against his oversized firearm he carried on his belt. I'm having difficulty reading. Good lord. Just one moment while I look at a thing real quick. Where's my mouse cursor? There it is. Oh, it was just me six telling everyone I'm live. Okay. Anyway, I saw a notification on Discord and I had to know. What was the closest call you ever had? Once when we were setting up some gas generator stations, I was carrying some kerosene oil and a gunny sack slung over my shoulder. The oil sprung a leak. Walking just behind me was a feller carrying... Feller? fella carrying a lit flare the next thing i knew the man let the torch touch the rack of my pack started going up in flames and with me tied to it and me tied to it i had a hell of a time breaking loose from the pack but i didn't get burnt too much it was time to start back out when jim began to move hey now jim called to a group that had started on you're going the wrong direction back the other way you see he added how easy it is to get turned around who can tell which way is north as many guessed one way as another, and we fully realized the satisfying feeling of safety in having such a man as these guides who know the pit like a pocket in a shirt. Comma, who know the pit like a pocket in a shirt. At last upon the surface, the sinking sun was spreading a panorama in Cerise? Cerise? And purple across the heavens, following Jim and... The waiting car slipped away, one at a time through the shadows into the desert back to the town, Gumption. Uh, the starting and ending point where we left our pilot of the underground to be picked up by the next party with the same curious ideas and funny questions. Christopher Benham is a Dallas travel consultant and writer and regular contributor to the Dallas Morning News. Secrecy surrounding NASA Venus Pro mission sparks intense speculation in conspiracy circles. Story on page 13b. Now that's an article that I want to read. Alright, newspaper. Yeah, okay. News this is a newspaper clipping from the Dallas Morning News in 1975. This is one of the earliest public accounts of the pit from the days when James Jackson used to personally give tours. Yeah, look at that. Look at that, everyone. We got through a thing and I didn't perish. But now I have to resize the page. see um let's see we have we read this oh i have to actually click on this one come on there we go jesus what's a louse a louse is a uh let me find you a picture of it this is a louse it's a, it's like a, uh, uh, it's lice. Like head lice. Anyway, there you are. 
Anyway, I'm here. Sorry for the delay. I'm going to be looking for a bit as I am doing things, but I'm here for the audiobook experience. Oh, well, you're going to have a not good time because I cannot read for shit tonight. Oh, Discord is showing me a thing. Oh, Pistol Grin Gary is doing a thing. Wonderful. My Discord window is resized and really weird looking. Anyway. That's okay, more realistic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Laos, they're gross. They're very gross. So anyway, this is Q&A uh, number two. So Depressed Pug asks, While the park was still open, has anyone ever tried to eat parts of the mystery flesh creature? I know they drink the fluid stuff, but what about the meat parts? This was a surprisingly common question during the park's operation. Yes, as a battery of other material and biological tests conducted on the discovery of the mystery flesh pit, samples of tissue were cooked and eaten. Those who conducted the impromptu tests, mostly field workers, reported that the muscle generally had a very gamey and offensive taste, but was otherwise very tender. Other tissues, such as lung, nerve, digestive, and fat deposits, were similar in taste and texture to awful. What is awful? O F F A L. Awful. Awful, also known, also called variety meats, pluck or organ meats, is the organs of butchered animals. Uh oh, it's it's head cheese. Okay, it's just organs amalgamated into like a bologna sort of deal. That's well, that's uh. That's creative. That is creative. I am here. I wanted to support, but flesh pits are gross. I'm going to just lurk and play 14. Happy streaming, Mr. Techcom, sir. Thank you, Mr. Combat Top Hat. I appreciate you. Uh, we're awful. That's right. Uh, for these reasons, consuming the tissues of the Permian Basin superorganism was and continues to be mostly seen as bad form and not worth the effort. However, many hikers and former fish and wildlife employees have started, have stated that a few of the lesser and non-venomous invertebrate species within the pit are excellent once steamed and served with butter. You know, just uh, just crack open that lice, that 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 louse, and steam it with a little bit of butter. Delicious. Has there ever been any commentary or attempts at intervention from PETA or similar animal rights groups uh, regarding potential harm and suffering done in the Permian base and the superorganism either before or after the incident? Uh, one would expect a high degree of controversy over the exploitation of the pit from a myriad of animal rights activists, but historically, this has not been the case. Small protests and short-lived action groups did exist sporadically during the history of the park's operation, but never granted much national traction. Some attribute this to the, generally, the general obscurity and unfamiliarity the general public had with the park despised the despite the global industrial involvement. Of course, in the months following the incident in 2007, there was a litany of protests and criticism, criticisms, criticisms from groups such as PETA and WWF. But these were among many of the other, of other protests and demonstrations from a variety of interests that were quickly lost in the frenzy. PETA. Anyway. Does the pit suffer? What a sentence. Does the pit suffer? Huh. Does anyone not? What an answer. Does anyone not? Fair enough. <laughs> Are there any... Humanos, Apache, or Comanche, the... Or Comanche, uh, the American Indian peoples native to the surrounding area, folk tales or oral histories concerning the superorganism. Okay, so this is where things start to get fascinating. I know a little bit about this. Um, this is where some of the lore starts to get a little bit deeper. This is interesting. There is a fascinating legend from a nearby, from the nearby Kado people about the name of sacred medicine water, which I will reproduce here. 
The favor of the Great Spirit rested on the abundant forest, flowers, songbirds, and small animals of these quiet hills. Then a fierce dragon devastated the land, bringing disease and hunger and hatred and greed on the people. The Indian nations pleaded with the Great Spirit to subdue the dragon into a deep slumber, and the might of all of the heavenly forces contrived to bury it under the world, where it shakes the earth even today. Once the great spirit had vanquished the dragon, he caused pure water to gush up from the earth from the beast and asked that his favorite place be held neutral ground so all can share in the healing waters. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? A little bit maybe like mm, an amniotic spring, for example. Anyway... And the final incident report, it is recommended that the nutrients of the superorganism's stomach is replaced with rocks to weaken it while preventing a hunger response. Do we know how long it can go without eating? Isn't there a risk, along with other containment measures, that the organism is killed? Even today, the full metabolic process of the Permian Basin superorganism is considered to be poorly understood. What is known is that its metabolic rate is incredibly slow, with a hybrid diet primarily consisting of subterranean hydrocarbon deposits, which it slowly digests and converts to energy. This is a very efficient method of producing the caloric energy necessary to provide the mystery flesh pit with energy, but does not account for the intake of specific organic components necessary in cellular reproduction and growth. Thousands of tons of bones and shells of prehistoric sea organisms have been found undigested at the bottom of the gate. Great, greater, greater gastric sea from within the pit, suggesting that the superorganism does exercise some kind of feeding cycle, though research into this is still ongoing. So this thing's pretty old, that it has some, uh, some, uh, prehistoric sea organisms at the bottom of its uh, gastric sea. Ugh, what a gross sentence. Gastric sea. Imagine that. Rumors of religious facilities built within the pit? That's not a question. That's a fragment of a question. A non-denominational interfaith chapel was added in the 1995 renovations to the Lower Visitor Center. It's primarily, it primarily exists for staff who may be working for extended periods within the pit with regular services conducted on Fridays, Saturdays, Sundays, and on religious holy days. Of course, guests are invited to visit the chapel as well, and many visitors enjoy the quiet and tranquil atmosphere created by the space. I don't have any details on it, but the Contingency Measure Facility referenced in the 2007 Disaster Overview Report uh, was designated as an escal... escal... oh my god. Oh, that's a word I don't know. Uh, ecclesi... oh, Jesus. Ecclesiatical? Ecclesiatical. Ec Ecclesiatical. Ecclesi ecclesiastical. 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 Okay, hold on. Hold on. I. This is going to bother me until I know how this is pronounced. One moment, please. How to pronounce blah. Ecclesiastical. Ecclesiastical, okay. Ecclesiastical. Ecclesiastical. What the fuck? I have never once in my life heard that word. That's a new word. I have learned a thing today, everyone. I hope you all are proud of me. Was designed as an ecclesiastical slash religious observance facility in the 1998 GSA construction budget report. Make of that what you will. Just how big is an abyssal copepod? Did they ever manage to get measurements on s or as much data on them? An adult abyssal copepod can grow as large as 15 to 20 feet! Eh! 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 Gross! Imagine if one of your gut bacteria was actually a bug and it was like 15 to 20 feet big. Imagine, imagine a fucking crocodile walking around in your insides. Ugh. 
Uh, with such species weighing in at over 310 pounds, of course, these species, these specimens, specimens, specimens are generally very rare and represent the 80th percentile and above, with most examples of the species being closer to 7 feet, 2 meters in length, and weighing approximately 180 pounds. The molting marks on the carapace can be used to date the age of a specific organism. In general, they live to be very old, with exceptional examples living well over 250 years. This is in stark contrast to gasp owls, which live for only a few minutes once they emerge from a cocoon. Those little gas bowels, those little creepy little gremlin fuckers running around, they only live for like a few minutes? What a, what an existence. What a, that is, that's kind of sad. Those little fuckers only live for like a few minutes. How do the park and superorganism, uh... Uh, deal with visitors polluting the place, stuff like littering, oil spills, etc. Now this is something I actually want to know. Like all national parks, most visitors to the Mystery Flesh Pit had little regard to properly disposing of garbage and would frequently leave trash wherever they were standing. With enclosed trails and facilities, this was easily dealt with through an active janitorial staff. On natural trails, it was more difficult to track down, as the cilia and mucosal action of many parts of the pit's anatomy would dispose of trash before park staff could identify. Uh, where all this trash went and what its long-term effect will be uh, is just one of the many mysteries of the Mystery Flesh Pit. A much more pressing problem, problem to park administration was emissions from diesel engines found in vehicles, equipment, and generators. While the tissues of the pit are surprisingly adept at absorbing the soot and particulate contaminants through aforementioned cilia and mucus, the CO2 exhaust from engines require a complex and extensive to maintain ventilation system in very deep or constructed parts of the anatomy where airflow was not feasible or even possible. Still, mining operations often found it more cost-effective to either rotate labor crews out on timed intervals to avoid CO2 poisoning, or would utilize the built-in air systems of the protective safety suits they were already wearing. Oil was just kind of dumped wherever. Amazing. Uh, just like the modern day, just they dump oil wherever they so please. Assuming there were sometimes human amalgamations. Okay, so remember last time in the last stream we talked about the amalgamations that happen in the pit. Uh, yeah, this is a thing. Uh, assuming there were sometimes human amalgamations or humans involved in an amalgamation, were there any way they could be helped or were they shit out of luck? The experimental and highly secretive medical procedure was pioneered by anodyne sponsored research scientists as Baylor. Uh, medical center in the late 1980s, which on, which at least a handful of occasions was able to quote unquote recover a person from amalgamation. The process essentially boiled down to five steps: identifying which organs slash tissues within the amalgamation were human, and if more than one human, uh, which organ tissues had differing DNA sequencing. Carefully removing as many organs as possible from the main amalgamation, with the brain being given highest priority. In cases where the brain was damaged or even partially fused, the procedure could not continue. Stabilizing the extracted or intact organs with brain priority uh, and allowing them to heal in a proprietary chemical solution derived from ballast. The brain and any other extracted organs would each be placed into a respective life support module before being connected together. Through a rudimentary DOS-based machine brain interface, it was possible through therapy to establish contact with the person who often retained full memory and mental cognizance. With training, the person could even develop some semblance of a quality of life through the use of cameras, microphones, text-to-speech vocalizers, and in a few cases, mechanical prosthetics such as armatures or arb ambulatory uh, life support equipment racks. It's important to note here, though, that despite the claims Anodyne made at the time that pharmaceutical at pharmaceutical uh, trade expos, the quality of life of these cyborgs was horrific and incredibly expensive for family members to maintain. The full procedure, if even possible, often ballooned into costs exceeding several million dollars to perform, with the end result being a room-sized nest of life support plumbing 
and boxy beige computer equipment prone to overheating. When the company was dissolved in 2008, much of this research became pr property of the U.S. government, which has repeatedly rejected my FOIA requests for more information on this issue. I just read that the Ranger Traversal Vehicle uses some form of x-rays as a mean of navigation. Will the x-rays not be harmful to flesh within the pit? As there are are there any known cases of things like cancer or sickness developing in slash on the pit? Despite the volume of x-ray slash and microwave radiation being emitted within uh, and through the pit, any such negative effects of their use have not been observed. It is believed that relative to the estimated size of the Permian Basin super, super organism, the amount of radiation introduced by human activity is relatively inconsequential to the overall health of the pit. What's the deal with a libido bath? And a meme. Okay, they put a meme. That's that's nice. They put a meme. We have memes, everyone. I'm so glad. My god, that was quite a bit to read. So, is everyone comfortable? Is everyone uncomfortable? Because, oh boy, I certainly am. Especially learning that this thing amalgamates people together if they get caught by the cilia and mucosal lining. Ugh. Let's see. Have we read this? I know we've looked at this, but we'll look at it again. Oh, and there's another Q&A. Let's go. Oh, you know what? Nope, we've read this. We have read this. I remember that this is God's work line. Anyway, look at this. The major parasitic fauna of the Permian Basin superorganism. So this is just a smattering of some of the creatures that uh, you could see in the mystery flesh pit. We have a greater ballast siren, and we have a lesser ballast siren. Just look at these horrific creatures. Look, They look like stuff that you would see at the bottom of a trench, honestly. These look like, these honestly look like extremophiles, like you'd find near a thermal vent. They are quite gross. Bone mite. How disgusting. Look at this thing, an abyssal copepod. So this is a thing that they said could be 15 to 20 feet. Look at this thing. Imagine this 15 to 20 foot lobster trudging after you after it sees you in the trail. Ugh. That's... That is vile. Yes. Okay, I'm glad, Crystal, that you're enjoying this. Okay, we have read that. Have we read this? Okay, but no, this is uh this is definitely uh the amalgamation thing that we were showing. So imagine imagine you're just you're walking around the trail and you decide to ignore the sign, you say fuck you sign and you decide to go on your own little path and then you get caught and dragged into the walls by the cilia. And then you feel searing pain as you are molecularly cellularly rather ripped apart and then merged with a bunch of different creatures. And then you're just plopped into this squelching, squealing, screaming, pain riddled mass. And then people discover you, and then they have to do exhaustive tests, and then they remove, like, your brain and put you in a jar. And just imagine. Actually, you know what? Probably don't imagine, because that'd be really mentally damaging to imagine. Just, oh, This is true cosmic horror. This is true cosmic terror. It's eldritch in nature. Oh yeah, this is the gas bowel. These poor little fuckers only live for a few minutes. That's so sad. Yeah, uh, we haven't read most of this, so uh, we'll go back to it, but this does have uh, a little bit of spoilers about the um, uh, the incident report, so we're going to leave it for now. So remember, number three. Uh, we've looked at that. We've watched this. 
I don't know if we've looked at this or this. But yeah, Coke Heartthrob. Let's go ahead and uh, take a gander at this sign. Welcome to Gumption, gateway to the Permian Basin super organism. Imagine being so proud that you would just put that on a sign. The Permian Basin super organism. Oh, it's just a sign. Okay, moving on. Taste the taste the Coke heartthrob sensation. Oh boy. Oh, uh, let's go. Coke heartthrob was first introduced on Valentine's Day in 1985 as a limited promotion, but sold so well over the summer that Coca-Cola added it to their primary beverage roster in 1986. The defining ingredient in Coke heartthrob was, of course, amniotic ballast harvest fr harvested from special glands deep within the mystery flesh pit. The potential aphrodisi aphrodisi aphrodisiacal aphrodisiacal that's the word <sighs> the potent aphrodisiacal properties of amniotic ballast were diminished by heavily diluting the chemical before adding it to the beverage but coke heartthrob still developed the notorious reputation for its unusual intoxicating effects the taste of coke heartthrob was described as syrupy sweet with hints of amaretto and rose water and the beverage had a light pheromonal scent similar to perfume a combination of increasing extraction costs after the 2007 tragedy, as well as changing cultural attitudes, ultimately saw the decline of the Coke heart of Coke Heartthrob sales until the Coca-Cola company decided to discontinue the beverage in 2011. Uh, so not only did people swim around in this ballast, but they decided to put it in products so that people could consume it. Uh. <laughs> You want some fluid from deep inside a flesh pit? Ugh. Oh, yeah, and these are all the designs. Let's look at these designs. So this is uh, typically what a park ranger and a trail guide would wear. Interpretive ranger. I imagine they didn't actually go out into the pit and they were a part of like a... Uh, maybe they were like inside of the visitor center. Uh, maintenance technician and a medic. A laborer. Oh, this poor man. He's not wearing much protective equipment. Imagine going out to the mystery flesh pit in this. You know what? Wait, so since this is a laborer, maybe he's also still working in the visitor center. I would not want to go out into the mystery flesh pit wearing nothing but this. I would want to be wearing something like this. Or this. Or th actually, you know what? They're exposed too. Oh my god. People walked around at this thing exposed, didn't they? You know what? This. I want to wear this. This looks like it'd be the safest thing to wear. I take it all back. This. <laughs> Shit. I can't make up my mind. This thing. Oh, my God. If there was ever a time to say get away from her, you bitch, this it would be wearing this suit. That would be the perfect time. Commercial mind technician and field scientist. Amazing. God, I love the mystery flesh pit so much. This is such a good ARG. All right, let's take a look at this. You can't find a more powerful computer in this century. AD1 Organic Tissue Interface Technology. Only a few years ago, large data processing tasks were the domain of bulky, powerful, and expensive mainframe systems. Now in 1984, Anodyne has introduced the world's first desktop supercomputer, utilizing state-of-the-art neural interface technology derived from the nervous tissue of the Permian Basin superorganism. The AD1 represents a new era of in-home and business computing. How powerful is the 81? Try 8 million floating point operations per second. Not impressed? Add 4 terabytes of organic tissue memory. OTM storage. Ugh! Organic tissue memory! Imagine if your hard drive was made of meat! Oh! <laughs> Imagine having to feed your computer. <laughs> Oh, no. 12 gigabytes of RAM. Jesus Christ. And built-in interfacing cap uh, capability of every major software developer on the market. If these don't sell you on the 81, then the low price point and low maintenance costs will. Okay. I, I don't know what to do anymore. Oh, it's, it's a literal... Oh, it's a literal flesh sheet. It's an actual flesh sheet. 
that does computing processes. You know what? This is, Craig, this is what you need to run games. You could run all of the games at once. Oh my god. One of the many lucrative results of the development of the Mystery Flesh Pit were tremendous advances in the fields of computer science and cybernetics. The American conglomerate Anodyne Incorporated pioneered the design and development of wet wetware. Oh, okay. This this author has definitely watched Ek Machina. <laughs> wetware. What a disgusting term. Wetware computing in the early 1980s by harvesting living nervous tissue from the Permian Basin superorganism. The processing capabilities provided by these living tissues were decades ahead of technology at the time and allowed Anodyne a brief commanding share of an already saturated computer market. While the user interface of these computers were similar to other machines at the time, the resource requirements necessary to power the electrical systems as well as the living tissue life support systems made them expensive to operate and almost impossible to repair without highly specialized equipment. Following the 2007 incident, which permanently closed the pit and plunged the company into bankruptcy, Anodyne was forced to dissolve its cybernetics division and related assets. Today, even late model wetware machines are rare to find outside of computer museums, as maintaining the internal organic tissues of these computers has been made effectively impossible with the loss of the proprietary knowledge and equipment after Anodyne was shuttered. <sighs> wetware, 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 it's fucking, fucking wetware. Oh, it's so gross. Fucking wetware. Okay, what is this? A deeper clean? Impossible. All right, let's see. What are you, what are you ladies selling? To get the deepest clean from a household or industrial cleaner, we had a to look deep, very deep. What we found were a line of organic, non-toxic detergents powerful enough to strip rust from steel, yet gentle enough for even the most delicate lace garments. As an environmentally conscious alternative to dry cleaning chemicals, use our patented yellow cleaner to eliminate even the toughest stains from wool, cotton, nylon, spandex, synthetics, and furs. For surfaces, surfaces such as floor and floors and countertops, try the blue cleaner. Not only disinfects, but can remove oil-based based stains from materials like stone and concrete. Our revolutionary green industrial solvent has found numerous applications in the manufacturing, mining, and petrochemical sectors. All of our products are available as a powder or suspended in liquid for convenient application, and you, and you can rest easy knowing that our materials are 100% American-made using sustain, sustainable harvesting practices from natural geobiological geo resources. From us, wherever bulk cleaning supplies are sold, anodyne. Okay, wetware. Yeah, okay, imagine coating your house <laughs> in mystery flesh pit juice. That is the power. That is, that's the power of Pine Sol, baby. <laughs> okay, I will be right back. Um, I need to use the restroom right quick, so everyone just, uh, Go ahead and enjoy this transition. We'll be right back. I'll just be like two minutes at most. Uh, oh, wait. Hold on. I should put on some music. Uh, let's see. History. Recently. History. <laughs> Can I find some music for y'all? Mad Monster Mansion. Let's go. I hope you all like Bango Kazoople. Because if you don't, I will end you. All right, I'll be right back. The mystery flash pit. Oh god. There was no way I was gone for like 6 minutes. Was it really that long? Good lord. Anyway, here we are. Welcome back. Why did I welcome myself back? Anyway. Ooh. 
Let's continue the journey into Beef Disney. I hate the fact that you just said that in my chat. Beef Disney. Beef Disney! Beef Disney. Ugh. Oh. Eh. Eh. Anyway. Let's go ahead and take a look at some of this shit. Oh, wait. Oh, yeah. Look at that. It's, uh... Oh, God. What have you done to me? Okay. Look at that. I don't know what this is supposed to be. I... Th oh, wait. Anodyne security. Is this supposed to be, like... I think that's supposed to be someone cut out of an amalgamation. Ugh. That's, uh... That's very uncomfortable. Moving on. Report on the... Report on the ineffective potential of nuclear deterrence as a defense mechanism as a defense against the Permian Basin superorganism. Conclusions and recommendations against, against any future use of fizzle detonation systems. Volume one. Unfortunately, only the cover could be photographed, but these very large series of DOE reports seem to suggest a very intensive investigation into the feasibility of using nuclear weapons to kill the Permian base in superorganism, and the conclusion seems to be a resounding no. Mmm, Beef Disney. That's the man himself, Beefworth J. Disney. Beef worth slipping Jim Disney. <laughs> slipping Jim. God, I love I love that name so much. Slipping Jim. Okay, apparently uh I can't click on this. So let's just open the image in a new tab and take a gander. Yep. That's that I think that's supposed to be a man cut out of the uh the super organism. Mmm, so that's lovely. Moving on. Ferrari of Dallas. Excuse me? The fuck does Ferrari have to do with this? Miss Rachel Frost, CO Greenpeace Foundation, 2609 University Avenue, Suite 2.112. Austin, Texas, uh, 7, 8, 7, uh, whatever. Ferrari Dallas dealership. Okay, apparently car thing. October of 1975. Miss Frost. Frost! It's your wife! She's in this! Frost. Uh, please excuse my regards, but I'm more than surprised after finding out about your interview with the Austin Sun. After you accused me of just about every kind of violation of nature possible. <laughs> after you accused me of just about every kind of violation of nature possible. What a sentence. My crew and I graciously went out of our way to give you and your friends a, p a personal tour of every aspect of our operation down in Gumption. I believed if you would have asked anyone present during that tour, they would have been more than inclined to believe that things were capital A all right, even amicable. So imagine my shock when I when today I read that myself and the hardworking folks at Anodyne are a cohort of blunt and thoroughly thoughtless rabble engaged in the systemic torture and of the greatest natural discovery of our generation. Now I get that... Mm, yeah. Now I get that you and I see the, word, the world differently, and that's okay, but to say these kind of things is an outright lie. As I told you during our first meeting, we are doing the best we can to minimize our impact on this creature. But... As we also have to protect ourselves and the scientists who go down and study it, even you yourself were a little shaky being down there with the passages reinforced, just to show you that my head isn't as dense as you make it out to be in your interview. I asked the Anodyne folks about why they weren't uh, handing over the pit to some university or government research outfit, and they said they were just doing a routine exploration of mineral... Uh, of mineral ex routine exploration of mineral exploration that's a weird thing to say 
I knew that hearing that'll make you red in the face, but they wanted me to re assure you and the general public that these explorations are mostly a formality to justify their research costs to the corporate bean counters, and that they don't really expect to find anything down there beyond some wholesome nat natural science. And despite what you said in your paper, they wanted me to make sure you understand that they only want what is best for the organism as they try and make some sense out of it. And to suggest that they plan to allow visitors to go down to it and even commercialize the pit is almost as ridiculous as your claim that I am a cowboy who is just in this for the money. Regards, James Jackson. Oh man, James Jackson is fucking pissed. P.S. I will be in Austin for a few days next month. Maybe you could apologize to me in person over dinner. <laughs> Damn! Well, uh, I hate to be break it to you, Mr. Slippin' Jim, but, um... Visitors going down into it and commercializing the pit is exactly what happened. So, uh... Good job there, sir. Yeah. Good job there, sir. Alright. Move it on. Let's see. There is a lot to look at, I must say. My god, there's a lot to look at. Good lord. But hey, we're near the top. We're near the top. We're almost done. Wow, okay, holy shit. Section... Uh, 1862 of the provisions appropriated and relinquished in this act under the headings Interior Geobiological Resources and Regulatory Interior, 120 million shall be for the expansion of resource exploration, extraction, refinement, and transportation activities as they relate to certain geobiological resources obtained through commercial mining leases granted by the Department of the Interior. Relocation of certain staff, equipment, and materials directly involved with the regulation and oversight of Permian Basin and superorganism resource extraction activities is subject to this broader economic stimulus program, of which 4 million shall be for issuing direct severance severance and early retirement benefit payments as amended 116 million shall be direct payment to the Permian Basin Recovery and Superorganism Containment Corporation form Anadyme Incorporated for internal reorganization and growth activities necessary in transition to the expanded role in increasing commercial extraction activities within and around the Permian Basin superorganism. Exclusion zone 95 million shall be for the construction of a new facility within the Permian Basin superorganism intended to aid in the logistics and processing of biological, chemical, and mi mineral resources derived from mining and... Some strange things in the COVID relief bill. Fucking got him. <laughs> Mystery Flesh Pit National Park. Let me take a swig of water. Let me take a swig of earth ballast. Because hallelujah, holy shit. That was quite the mouthful to say. Gift Gardens. Oh, is this just an advert? It's just an advert. Mystery Flesh Pit National Park Gift Gardens. Well, that's really stylized and cool, and I would totally hang this on my wall. Actually, unironically, I would hang this on my wall. I would, like, I'd hang it right over there. Because <laughs> that's, that's actually a really cool poster. Well done. Well done. I really like that. Oh, my lord. Oh, boy. Uh, whereas it appears that the... Na la 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 la. Whereas it appears that the public interest would be promoted by reserving this natural uh, wonder as a natural park together with as much land as may be needed for the protection, not only for the known excavated entrance, but for other entrances as may be found. Now, therefore, I, James Carter, James Carter Jr., President of the United States of America, by authority of the power in me vested by Section 2 of the Act of Congress entitled An Act for the Preservation of American Antiquities, approved eight, June 8th, 1906, 34, stat 
2.225, do proclaim that there is hereby reserved from all forms of appropriation under the public land laws, subject to all valid existing claims and set apart as a national park to be known as the Mystery Flesh Pit National Park, all that piece or parcel of land in the county of Gumption, state of Texas, shown upon the diagram at head row, uh, here too, uh, annex, head row, here too, annexed, and made a part hereof, and more particularly described as follows, lots one and two, section 31, block 17. God damn, that's hard to read. Uh, why must politicians make everything so fucking hard to read? Warning is hereby expressly given uh, to all authorized persons not to appropriate, injure, destroy, or remove any features of this park, and not to really, like, ro ro to, bruh! And not to locate or settle upon any of the lands thereof. <sighs> the director of the National Park Service under the direction of the Secretary of the Interior shall have the supervision, management, and control of the park as provided in the Act of Congress entitled, quote, an act to establish a National Park Service and for other purposes, end quote. God damn. Let's take a look at this. This is... It really is just a pit in the ground, isn't it? <laughs> It really is just a pit in the ground, isn't it? Uh, photos of the April 1980 annexation, which brought the mystery flesh pit into the U.S. National Park System. President Carter, near the end of his presidency, met with DOI and anodyne personnel uh, at the entry site itself to officially sign the proclamation. Before an aerial photo of the pit and surrounding site captures the scale of work that took place from 1978 to 1981 to develop and improve the park's interior infrastructure. El Hashtag Eldritch Abomination. <laughs> has that tag been there the whole time? I feel like it has been the whole time. I like that hashtag. Hashtag Eldritch Abomination. Use a hashtag to describe yourself. Anyway. Permian Basin Recovery and Superorganism Containment Corporation. Look at that. It's anodyne. Personnel Transport Shuttle. Imagine... <laughs> Oh my god, just imagine this this thing down in the pit, or around the pit. Actually, you know what, this would not be down in the pit, this would be around the pit. This is just, is this just a picture of a thing at Gumption? I guess so. I'm not seeing anything Mystery Flesh Pit related in this picture. Anyway. Overnight stop in Gumption, Texas, former home of the Mystery Flesh Pit National Park. Yep. All right, we're about to get to the disgusting thing. Oh wait, hold on. Oh, here, shit, here it is. Uh, that's right, it's on Imager. Uh, the full investigation report of the 2007 disaster, which ultimately forced officials to close the park to the public. That will be one of the last things that we read tonight, because this is the actual incident report. We're going to look at that later. For, for now, let's look at... <laughs> let's look at the evolution of the amorphous shame, shall we? Now, I bet you're wondering, what in the fuck is an amorphous shame? Well, I'll tell you. Who needs a body? Let me just ask that. Who needs a body? Did you know that the amorphous shame got its name as, from, an, as, blah, blah, from its appearance as an ungainly clump of organs because these shy creatures live their entire lives within folds or pockets within the moist insides of the mystery flesh pit. They do not have need or for traits like bones, skin, or eyes. Instead of foraging for food, the, amor the amorphous shame extends a siphon tube appendage beyond a flesh burrow to slurp up liquid aminos and proteins which grow and leak from nutrient sacs from within Mystery Flesh Pit's anatomy. By losing eyes and other organs, the amorphous shame has cleverly reduced its caloric metabolic requirements. God, gross. This is disgusting. So, do you, you ever get wild about nature? Just wild about nature? Yeah. 
So this is essentially like what they what the author has cleverly written as like evolution within the mystery flesh pit. So look at this cute little lad, right? Just scamping around on the surface world, not a care in the world except for, you know, danger and whatnot, but you know. It's a pit weasel. It's exactly it. So, 14.8 MYA. A common ancestor of both the amorphous shame and long-tailed weasel enters the orifice of the Permian Basin superorganism. So then, 11.2 MYA. The Mustela subterranea begins to elongate to form in form to better navigate the anatomical interpit environment. So then later on, the adaptation to the caustic environment has left the amorphous shame hairless, toothless, and blind. Liquid bolus from the environmental process provides sustenance. So then later on, a life spent suckling at nutrient nodes has atrophied the muscles and skeleton of Mustela subterrana. Eyes and limbs are completely vestigial, and then the present day, this is the amorphous shame shown removed from the burrow. This is an artist cutaway of the amorphous shame in a flesh burrow. So this thing lives inside of a pocket and extends a little appendage out to suck up things. Mystery flesh pit, the snack that smiles back, literally. I can't smile back anymore. It doesn't have a mouth, it just has a siphon. So imagine you're walking around in the pit and you just see a little finger just go like like outside of a crack in the wall. <laughs> oh, I hate that I just described that. Oh, why did I describe it like that? <laughs> That's even worse. Oh, it's a surprise pit weasel. Mustela subterrana, more commonly known as the amorphous shame, is a rare and fascinating form of wildlife unique to the Mystery Flesh Pit National Park. These unshapely creatures puzzled scientists and, um, ethicists for years, but thanks to DNA sequencing, biologists today have a comprehensive idea of how these interesting animals came to be. So imagine, you're a weasel, you slip into the pit, and you're like, well, this is my life now. And then you find other weasels that were like, well, this is my life now. And you just live in the pit and you slowly evolve over time into this thing. What a downgrade. <laughs> imagine going from this to this. And now I don't want to imagine anymore. The curiously named the Morphous Shame is a strange and highly unique animal found living within pockets of flesh inside the mystery flesh pit. The name was earned by the appearance of of the creatures which seem to be living collections of loose organs. In reality, amorphous shames have simply been shaped by the forces around them, in much the same way that contemporary domestic dog breeds barely resemble their wolf ancestors. I don't like comparing this to domestic dogs and wolves, but I see the comparison. Because, you know, domestic dogs are essentially just piles of organs in a flesh pocket. Oh, we got hot pockets, we got lean pockets, then we got flesh pockets. Moving on. This is just a cool artwork. And this is actually uh, a little bit of a, a spoiler, I guess you could say, for the 2007 incident. Yeah, we'll just leave that at that. Weasel ascended to blob. Ew. <laughs> yeah, man, it's disgusting. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. Oh, perfect. Yes, okay. So they have the uh, text version of it. So we'll just get rid of the imager version. Because I don't trust imager. And let's see. Mystery Flesh Pit. Here we go. Journey Below. Your encounter with the Mystery Flesh Pit National Park. I'm trying to resize this so I can read it. And you could see the text properly. Oh, God help you if you can read that. Uh, God help you if you can't read that, rather. Ugh. Anyway. 
Your encounter with the Mystery Flesh Pit National Park begins at the Permian Basin Desert of Weston, Texas. Beyond the familiar surroundings of rugged brush and broad plains is a gateway to another world, away from sunlight, away from the still ground, away from the comfort of the surface world lies the sublime wonder and terror of the Mystery Flesh Pit. It is an incomparable realm of giant anatomical formations and extraordinary introspective voyages deep into the soul of those who venture within. The first tethered oil workers who wandered, who entered the pit had no idea what to expect as they slid, crawled, and were swallowed down into the darkness. Today, many wonders of the mystery flesh pit are well known, yet the experience of exploring its depths is every bit as exciting. Oh, God. Hey, look, there's a Marriott over there. <laughs> Spasm fits! Spasm fits! Okay, I gotta know, what the fuck does spasm fit? Okay, you know, hold on. Hold on. Open image in new tab. Spasm fits! On occasion, lucky park visitors may observe a natural phenomenon as fascinating as the flesh pit itself, and what scientists think to be an immune response to continued dilation. The pit and she orifice begins to violently choke and spasm against retaining braces. This impressive display of vigor, which may last as long as 20 minutes, often features otherworldly tectonic carnal moans from deep within the mystery flesh pit, which can be heard from miles in all directions. You can view this exciting spectacle from the outdoor amphitheater near the gondola pavilion. These choking fits usually occur following extensive engineering improvements within the pit. Check at the visitor center for scheduled engineer engineering developments. Due to gastric ejecta from the pit entry orifice, eye protection is recommended when directly viewing a spasm fit. Oh, good. You know, you're just viewing this thing, this thing choking against metal straws, and then it just vomits on you. That's nice. I love it. So... A word on safety. You like that, everybody? Let's do a word on safety. The only thing that will make this worse is if we find out the beef pit can enthrall people. We'll get to that when we get to that. For obvious reasons, the Mystery Flesh Pit is unlike any other park within the National Park system. It is an incomprehensibly fast and ancient or vast and ancient organ. Oh my god, imagine if this thing was fast. Ugh. Vast an ancient organism whose origin and purpose is unknown to modern science, and a thing which inspires a deep and primal and instinctual gut fear in the hearts of all men who gaze into it. Although the safety infrastructure installed within the pit are marvels of man's engineering aptitude and attitude of extreme caution, vigilance, and respect are expected of all park visitors. <laughs> To ensure that your tour of the Mystery Flesh Pit is comfortable, enjoyable, and safe, please follow these important rules and recommendations. Wear closed-toed, non-skid boots for walking on natural flesh trails, which can be steep and slippery. Use handrails where available. Drink plenty of water. The pit is known to leach moisture from humans! A pregnant women are not advised to explore the Mystery Flesh Pit as smoking is permitted within all trails. Oh, God, imagine you're walking in this thing. That's bad enough, but it reeks of cigarettes. <coughs> anyway, stay on park trail, on marked trails. Beyond the trails are steep and slippery drop-offs where you could fall and injure yourself, and you could get lost and become digested with an unreinforced organs. Encounters with macrobacteria and abyssal copepods have been lethal for visitors and have who have strayed far from marked trails. In an emergency, several blue illuminated telephones installed along trail routes will connect you to the Lower Visitor Center Emergency Response Command. Hold on. What do I want to read next? Uh... 
Let's look at exploring the mystery. Also, this, 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 this picture. This picture. Descent gantry. We down you go past whatever the fuck this is and that and that and that and bone. No, I don't fucking know. Look at look. It's just imagine you descend into an open pimple. An open pimple that wants to digest anything that goes into said pimple. Explore the mystery flesh pit. Choose a from a variety of guided and unguided tours depending on your time, interest, constitution, and physical ability. Your first stop for any pit tour is the lower visitor center, where park rangers can answer your questions about the flesh pit and where you may rent specialized gear and equipment. Park rangers may also provide details about special activities and tell you about special ranger-led excursions. Bowels at the Earth Route. Uh, the basic tour through the Mystery Flesh Pit is the Bowels of the Earth Route, a 7.85 mile self guided stroll through many large and famous features like the Thor's Rib Cage, Septum Falls, God's Mistake, and Oyster's Shame. Highly unusual and immense, the Bowels of the Earth Route is a must see tour for all visitors of the park. Gondola rides for the surface take you directly to the reinforced lower visitor center. Relatively level, well-lit, completely enclosed trails make this an ideal tour for visitors with walking difficulties or those with small children. Guts and Giddy Up Route The Guts and Giddy Up Route is a self-guided tour available to visitors with limited spelunking and or diving experience and in good physical condition. This 4.75 mile tour follows the original explorer's route guiding and entering the sand gullet from the base of the lower visitor center this route descends over 750 feet into the pit following slippery and narrow flesh tunnels through a large dorsal organ called the trunk the route circles back to the lower visitor center near the unenclosed restrooms on level four Highlights along this route include a desiccated copepod nest, a prehistoric whale carcass, the somber circus clown Chimus, and Fondue Village, a complex maze of wax-like secretions resembling dwelling-sized bone marrow. And then there's the Swallowed Hole Tour. The two-hour ranger-guided Swallowed Hole Tour goes through several scenic and undeveloped organ sections. Departing from the lower visitor center, the tour descends into the deepest portions of the mapped pit anatomy. Although not as difficult as the guts and giddy up route, this one mile tour does require park visitors to descend and later climb an eight story high, actively peristolic esophageal passage. Jesus! Gross! Reservations are recommended. Contact the park or visit uh, the park website. A separate fee for endoscopic spelunky equipment is charged for this tour. Note, this tour is not recommended for those who suffer from claustrophobia and a fear of being eaten. Rangers are available through the marked tours to help you with information, first aid, and coping mechanisms. All primary facilities within the Mystery Flash Pit are hermetically enclosed air conditioned and structurally reinforced temperatures within unenclosed areas of the pit are normally 98.6 degrees fahrenheit year round with humidity ranging from 80 percent to full saturation we all having fun yet so who wants to visit the mystery flesh pit Imagine if it was a <laughs> Imagine if it was a fucking TikTok challenge to go down into the mystery flesh pit. Oh. Uh, anyway, moving on. Other park activities. The Visitor Center. The Visitor Center has information about the mystery flesh pit history, biology, and theology. Publications, models of models, a schedule of activities and exhibits, exhibits. Exhibits are available. Rangers can help you plan your visit. A kennel, a first aid station, and a non-denominational chapel are available at the Visitor Center main building. And then there's Caver Coop IMAX Theater Experience. This is a 45-minute immersive and educational film. Children and fear for fearful visitors will laugh at the animated hijinks of Caver Coop as he learns about the mystery flesh pit and faces his fears of being eaten alive and getting lost in the dark. Shows occur every hour within the park's site of the art... 200... In the state-of-the-art uh, 200-seat IMAX theater. 
Amniotic Thermal Springs. Located on the ground floor of the visitor center by the vending machines are the amniotic baths. Amniotic secretions are pumped from glands deep within the pit for visitors who are unable to descend into the pit. These springs are known to have a range of positive effects on human psychology, physiology, and well-being, and are enjoyed both medicinally and recreationally. Note, as the visitor center is a family-friendly facility, the surface spring baths are di diluted to a 1 to 20 potency ratio with filtered water. For higher concentrations within adult-only baths, park guests are encouraged to visit the Pleasure Domes, located east of the lower visitor center complex, complex <laughs> within the Mystery Flesh Pit. And then there's the historical ritual site. Archaeological research of the ground above the Mystery Flesh Pit uncovered the remains of an ancient ritual site believed to have been utilized by indigenous cultures uh, to perhaps communicate with the Mystery Flesh Pit. Sadly, much of these runes were destroyed by construction activity when the park was first discovered, and what little remains of the site offers no clues pertaining to the pit or activities which had transpired there. Today, the ritual grounds have a picnic area with tables, grills, drinking water, and restrooms. Isn't it lovely? Isn't it fucking lovely? Lodging and dining options. All right, let's see. The Mystery Flesh Pit National Park is so fortunate to host a range of corporate partners who add exceptional value to any park visit. There's the Marriott Hotel and Suites. And then there's the gift shop and food concourse. Uh, connects the visitor center in Marriott Hotel and offers a unique shopping experience feature authentic, authentic mystery flesh pit souvenirs and memorabilia. Dining options within the concourse include the famous Hard Rock Cafe as well. <laughs> oh, God. Hard Rock Cafe. You want to go to the Hard Rock Cafe at the mystery flesh pit? Let's fucking go. As well as a taste of Southwest Fair with a Chili's 2. Chili's 2. Chili's too. Amazing. Imagine feasting. And you're just having a good time at the Chili's too, or the Hard Rock, with the view of the Mystery Flesh Pit in sight, and it just vomits all over the windows while you're eating. Makes that chicken sandwich all the more delicious, doesn't it? Anyway. I hope you all hated that as much as I did. Hashtag Mystery Flesh Pit, hashtag visual. Great. Let's see. My god, there how much more do we have? We have quite a bit. Oh god. Never mind. Maybe I was wrong. Let's look at this and 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 this. Vomit on the window as well as a your dominance. <laughs> Just vomit back into the pit. It's fine. So let's take a look at this. Venterial Environment Excursion Vehicle. Holy crap. Look at this thing. Oh, this thing. Oh, this thing moves by digging into the flesh and like moving at a corkscrew. Oh, ugh. that's that's not comfortable. That's very uncomfortable. Imagine if your pills were ribbed. Ugh. The Venterial Environment Excursion Vehicle was developed by Anodyne Incorporated in the late 1970s to act as a multi-role utility vehicle platform for applications within the Mystery Flesh Pit. The vehicle architecture employs a set of twin counter-oriented screws for propulsion. As the wet and uneven interior of the Mystery Flesh Pit anatomy makes wheels, tracks, and other conventional locomotive strategies ineffective. Okay, fair enough. Though cargo, flatbed, liquid transport, and wildlife transport variants of the Vive could be found throughout the park, the Safari variant of the most was the most familiar to park guests. For the price of an ambular tour ticket, uh, visitors to the Mystery Flesh Pit National Park could be driven on a three-hour tour of some of the most spectacular and inaccessible locations within the park, all while sitting in complete comfort. The tour vehicles comfortably seat eight guests with room for one stewardess, tour guide, and two drivers located in the lower cab beneath the front of the vehicle. Inside the main cabin were eight rotational plush seats, a small lavatory, and a small galley kitchenette for serving refreshments. Powerful lights on the exterior of the 
vehicle allowed guests to view the otherwise dark pit interior through the large reinforced cabin windows. The vehicle was powered by two diesel engines connected to a proprietary transmission, uh, which provided the necessary horsepower and torque to easily traverse the interior of the mystery flesh pit. For navigation, a large ultrasonic instrument in the nose of the Vive provided drivers with a three-dimensional map of anatomy within a 40-meter, 30-degree cone directly in front of the vehicle. Man, they really thought this shit out. This author really thought this shit out. Amazing. All <sighs> right. Tragically, several dozen guests were trapped and later died within these vehicles during the fall during and following the 2007 disaster. At least one vehicle was crushed completely flat while the door hatch of another was forcibly pried open by opportunistic and hungry park wildlife turning the chaos. Oh my god. Perhaps the most well-known incident as portrayed in the 2012 fire in the deep involved an armed mining rig and its crew which were able to escort and protect two full tour vehicles uh, until they could safely escape to the surface. Though the crew and tunneling vehicles were gruesomely destroyed. Though the crew and tunneling vehicle were gruesomely destroyed by a large parasitic organism. Jesus Christ. The grim legacy of the Vive was not diminished. Ha has not diminished the utility of the craft, however. And the vehicles have continued to be used by the Permian Basin Recovery Operation well into the present day to shuttle researchers and other limited personnel through various sections of the former national park. Wait, so they're trying? They're still trying to get into this thing, bruh. I agree, bruh. I mean, to be fair, if I had to be trapped in the mystery flesh pit. I would probably want to be trapped in one of these vehicles because, you know, it is relative comfort, well, you know, while you're trapped inside it. But still, you know, it's something. My God, is it something. Oh, that's just uh, users. Oh, God, what is this? Entry Park Wellness Resource. Re resort service guides services guide god i cannot read oh my god so look at this these are all right these are all like the uh the the, the services that are in there hold on oh god where damn it there we go i want to look at this picture okay welcome to the intra park wellness resort at the mystery flesh pit national park the following is a guide of helpful information which explains the services and activities available to all resort guests. Please refer to any of the following sources for additional information concerning activities throughout the Mystery Flesh Pit National Park. Good lord. So let's see. We have first aid, signage, weapons. For the safety of all guests, please do not discharge any type of weapon while inside the Mystery Flesh Pit National Park. This includes firearms, air guns, Archery equipment and fireworks. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, nothing to soothe the existential horror and panic of being eaten by the planet's butthole like a comfy seat. Well, I mean, of course. If I had to die, I'd want to die in comfort. I would not want to die, like, being amalgamated into something, you know? I'd want to be inside of, like, an armored vehicle. Please see the red wildlife safety brochure with important information regarding interactions with local park flora and fauna. Flora? This thing has plants in it? Oh my god. Do not attempt egress uh, to exterior services areas on the gastric sea side of the resort building. These areas are subject to continual exposure to corrosive and toxic gastric chemicals, which are lethal to human life. 
Exterior surfaces are slippery and present opportunities to slip off the superstructure and into the gastric sea. The resort buildings are the resort building is hermetically sealed for your protection. Nah, bro. Become part of John and Malcolm. They're good people. Oh, don't call them John and Malcolm. See more about Mystery Flesh Pit on the App Store and on Google Play. <laughs> what the fuck? Wait, hold on. Hold up. I, I gotta see this. Does this actually do a thing? Oh no, okay, never mind. <laughs> it just leads to the Tumblr app. I, I just had to take it off of the screen in case it led to something naughty. Or something not very savory. Alright, let's see. Mystery Flesh Pit National Park on Tumblr. Yep. Thermal Spa. Inspired by the unique rituals of the American Southwest, blended with the sublime wonder and bounty of the Mystery Flesh Pit, the Thermal Spa at the Inter Park Wellness Resort is a world-class wellness facility unlike anything on Earth. I don't want to swim in the juices. I'm good. I don't want to swim in the juices. I do not want to swim in the juices. I do not want to swim in the juices. I'm good. I don't want to swim in the juices. I'm fine. <sighs> Our amniotic hot springs are modeled after the natural amniotic ballast bul bulbules oh. found within the park, but are reinterpreted in soothing contemporary materials for... Okay, whatever. Ugh, it's so, I've read enough about the amniotic springs. I don't want to know. Signature facial. Does that happen in the libido pit? Signature massage. Does that happen in the libido pit? Blossoming peach fusion treatment. Does that happen in the... Anyway. Signature manicure and pedicure. God, they really did do all this shit down in the pit. Ah. Ah. The Interpark Wellness Report is pleased to offer a revolutionary new addition to the therapeutic regime. A fully immersive experience that combines the relaxed natural beauty, exceptional hospi hospitality, and healing spa treatments of the thermal spa with the benefits of cutting-edge neuroscience and a ritualist ritualistic ritualistic <laughs> what? Medicine inspired by a collection of Eastern and Western mystical practices. Okay, look. Okay, if you want to swim in the juices, that's fine for you. Me, personally, no. I'm good. I don't want to swim in the juices. This has got to be horrific. Is it? You're down in a pit made of flesh, and it's squelching and pulsing, and the walls are, like, moving and amorphous and whatnot. There, if I was down in those springs, there would be no way in fuck I would be able to relax. There would be no way in fuck I'd be able to relax. I'd look up on the walls and see cosmic horror as my body tingles from whatever the fuck's in the water. <laughs> Good. And if I'm down even further, then I'm, I'm horrified and horny. I don't want to be horrified and horny at the same time. <sighs> Our total wellness retreat draws upon the powerful benefits of ballast-assisted therapy and is designed to be adjuncts to other ongoing psychotherapy reg regimens. <sighs> Held in a lightly structured environment, it's surrounded by the genuine neolithic aesthetic of the original will serve as ritual sites. Guests may achieve new levels of psychosexual and paracognitive enrichment. No! I'm good! I don't want to swim in the cosmic soup! Fuck you, Crystal! I'm sorry, that, that was completely uncalled for. Anyway. <laughs> ah, yes, cosmic horny. Alright. Along the way, you will engage in personal exploration through guided sessions with our total wellness staff of mystical science practitioners and common technicians with tantric attendance available as needed. The treatment encourages a complete reset of the nervous system. <laughs> a, a complete reset of the nervous system, huh? Your entire body goes numb and then you start to feel your limbs again. Oh my god. And a supportive environment that provides a beneficial time out from the burdens of reality and a physical mind. Oh! 
Wait a minute. Oh, fuck. What were the name of those baths that you can go to in real life? Um, It's like a bath that you just sit there in water and like highly salty water and you just float there in complete darkness and you don't do anything. What the fuck were those called? Oh, God. What the fuck were those called? Sensory deprivation chamber. Oh, Crystal. Crystal, you put it right as I remembered it. Sensory deprivation chambers. Thank you very much. Yes. I will give you the credit for reminding me, even though I remembered it. This is this is kind of like the ballast amniotic fluid f fleshy pit equivalent of a sensory deprivation chamber. I've never been in a sensory deprivation chamber. Are they pretty cool? Are they pogger? I don't know. I don't know if they're pogger. Anyway... Oh my god, Interpark Wellness Resort is not a medical practice or medical facility. We partner with the Anodyne Pharmaceuticals and deliver ballast-assisted therapy, medical and other services. Oh my god, whatever, whatever. It's gross, you're just, you're, you're soaking in juices. You're soaking in the cosmic juice, the cosmic soup, and I don't want to see more about the flesh pit. Thank you, I'm good. Now let's see more about the mystery flesh pit. Hold on. Uh, there was more to read. There we are. Scans of an in-room service brochure from the ho the resort hotel constructed within the mystery flesh pit. Wait, there was a there was a resort hotel within the pit. There was a resort hotel in the pit. There was a resort hotel in the pit. You know, I thought the worst that they went was like there was a restaurant at a Burger King in the pit. No. They, imagine going to sleep. You look out the window and you see the gastric sea or you fucking see walls of flesh and you go to sleep. And you wake up, look over to your wife and like, oh, hey, honey, wake up. It's morning. We got to go take our tour. And then you look outside the window. It's just steak. It's all steak. Ugh. Anyway, <sighs> moving on. Constructed within the Mystery Flesh Pit National Park, most likely from around 1998 to 2000. The Interpark Wellness Resort was one of the most ambitious achievements of the NPS Anodyne Partnership and saw healthy attendance and continual growth. Don't call it growth. <laughs> throughout its ill fated service life. <sighs> this service brochure gives a glimpse at the scale of development that was occurring within the National Park and should indicate the degree to which Anodyne and its partners were making fortunes from the exploitations of the Permian Basin superorganism. <sighs> These sorts of items are hard to find in this condition as the Interpark Resort suffered tremendous damage after the 2007 disaster. Structurally, the facility was built in the wall of the Gator into the wall of the Greater Gastric Sea. So it was it was actually above the Gastric Sea. I was joking. You know, I was joking. I was joking that there would be a resort above the Gastric Sea. And by God, there actually is. God damn it. And the location of an existing ulcer... Oh, this poor thing had an ulcer, and we exploited it and built a hotel in it. We built a hotel in the ulcer. They built a hotel in the ulcer. And was anchored by hundreds of hydraulic rams and suspension cables. After years of neglect and abandonment, many speculate that the resort is at great risk of collapsing into the churning acid sea surrounding it. You know, that's... You know, that's even worse. That's even worse. Imagine going to sleep and you wake up and your room's flooded with acid and there's nothing you can do and you just die as you wake up. Or imagine you're going to sleep and just having that fear in the back of your head that the entire fucking building could plunge into the gastric sea. That I hate this. I hate this. <laughs> that's so disgusting. Downtown Gumption. There's the Burger King. There's the Mystery Flesh Pit. This is a tourist map of Gumption, Texas from around the year 1998. Meant to be a caricature of the city's historic downtown area. That's a bit fucked. Yes, it is. 
Uh, the, 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 a Gumdrin, Texas, population 11,500 at this at its peak, as a small town located approximately 22 miles north of the surface orifice of the Mystery Flesh Pit. Ugh. Throughout the discovery and development of the park, Gumption service served as an important staging area for explorations of the pit before full facilities were set up, all the while eagerly selling any and every vice imaginable to the thousands of roughneck workers who flooded to the region to build the infrastructure within the pit. By the middle of the 1980s, families were the primarily, primary draw of the unique national park, so the city pivoted to keep up with the demands of the tourism. Today, some 14 years later, the closure after the closure of the park, the city of Gumption is an almost empty town, a fraction of its former size. The few hotels and restaurants left cater mainly to the routine droves of specialist workers and crew, uh, which labor to keep the slumbering superorganism contained. It's empty streets haunted by the specter of a golden era gone. Oh my god. <laughs> Oh my god, what the hell? Caution. The ventarial environment beyond this bulkhead constitutes the interior systems of a, of a living organism. This environment is actively hostile to human life. Serious injury and death may occur without proper equipment and training. Did I just hear something? Nope, never mind. I thought I heard something in the Discord chat. I am disgusted. <laughs> but you're supposed to be. The Mystery Flesh Pit is it's a wonderfully disgusting thing. Now let's get rid of that. Voyage beyond the unknown and behold a wider world of nightmares and dreams. Seek out the sublime corpus in the cosmos of the cosmos made flesh. Gaze into the mirror well of the deep and find answers in noises and smells and macabre and fantastic sights and sound. You know, just casually smiling as you look at the map, and this guy is just like, hey, look at this fucking map of the flesh pit. All of the old doubts may return, but we'll be right here with you every step of the way. Visitor information desk located on level 5 within the lower visitor center. Open 7.30 a.m. to 8 p.m. seven days a week. The mystery flesh pit. <sighs> I hate this. <laughs> Experiences of a flesh pit mine worker, huh? All right, let me read this real quick. <sighs> Dear Brandon, I'm writing you back about your career report project for school. I hope you find my re response satisfactory. It's my experience, and it's all true. I was 17 when I signed on with the company to work a full tour. The money they promised for nine months of work was more than I could have made in a lifetime in any other career. I was a shit-kicking drop dropout from Hobbs. Uh, most people already know that the real money is made in pumping up ballast, but they have, but they have it automated to the point where you only need someone to babysit the equipment. What a lot of people don't know is that there. Uh, there are a bundle of other minerals, gels, gases, and oozes that are worth more than their weight in gold for their myriad industrial applications. The big three are blue, blue tissue, pearls, corpusite, and black bone, oscurolite. Uh, our rig was outfitted to hunt for pearls, great crystalline spheres that were 2 to 15 feet wide, hard as diamond, smooth and clear as glass, with an otherworldly iridescent shimmer. That sounds beautiful, actually. They are embedded in different ways deep down in the pit, and to get to them, you have to cut, trudge, plunge, and crawl through miles and miles of muscles and guts and cartilage and bone that are fighting you the whole way. That's where we make our paychecks. A full mining crew is 18 men, and yes, it's pretty much always men, which includes two to three mining engineers, a medic, two mechanics, a venterial tech, two company men to oversee everything, and ten hired hands like me. You sign up for nine months at a time, split up into three-month stints with two weeks between, two-week breaks in between. Down in the flesh, your home and lifeline during those dark months is a mining rig. A huge machine almost as big as a neighborhood street, bristling, bristling with tools and racks and sensors and floodlights. The insides are tight and cramped, arc 
crew medic had been a submariner uh, for eight years and still told us that the sub he served in was more spacious. Still compared to being outside the rig in the raw pit, the cramped bunks felt like luxury. Ideally, the rig cuts as it goes, leaving a burnt cauterized path through the meat all, while also crushing and processing any minerals it runs into. In the real world, the pit isn't uniform, and you end up running into all kinds of obstacles requiring interventional solutions. Or the brass up top decides that they don't want you to just want you just cutting through certain parts of the anatomy. So you suit up and get out ahead of the rig and poke and prod and pry at the at a walking pace eight hours a day for times at a week. Rigs have big hydraulic arms that reach forward and push, lift, and splay open organs and muscle bundles before us roustabouts would go in and suck up or hose out any blood, cut tendons, cauterized tissues, rinse, and repeat. God, this sounds like hell on earth. This sounds like hell. I hope they got paid well. Because the methods for finding things like pearls are based on shaky science at best, a lot of time we spend probing around until you find pay dirt. Oh my god. Uh, when you find a decently sized cluster, we set up camp and would go about breaking them down. The rigs have a huge mining laser that they can free up, use to free up any gigantic pearls or black bone clusters. Clusters? Clusters. But most of the time, you're just out there with big tools to break them free. My position has been vacated the had been vacated the year before because the hand what my position had been vacated the year before because the hand got crushed under a tissue catchment bucket. Think giant steel wall tray weighing half a ton used to catch salop and other meat before it falls into your working area. And he bled out because it took hours for an ambulance to get out to the location. And the nine months I worked that rig, I had a a few very close calls into getting crushed. What keeps you from being crushed by the weight of all the body above you is a mess of cabling and fold-out frames connected to a 50,000-pound counterweight. After an eight-hour shift of scope pulling, meaning removing all the length of an endoscope pipe from probe line, I got a bit careless and was hitching my tongs to the pipe when, while it was still in motion. And the idea being that it shaved a few seconds per disconnection, and it added up to a long shift. What I forgot is that near the head of the endoscope, the pipe diameter changed by two inches. The rig operator was pulling full speed when the larger pipe came back, and my tongs grabbed the pipe and suddenly launched back, and was suddenly launched backwards. Jesus Christ. I held onto the tongs and it jerked me a couple feet back and I let go. The heavy tong cable went taut and the operator stopped uh, the brakes at the same time. And the whole thing was jerked to a sudden halt. The huge tackle block was clanging around the whole cavity like a giant ringer and a bell. and buckled one of the support frames. Everybody jumped clear and we ducked and braced until whatever we could with whatever we could until the rig stopped shaking. It was probably fortunate that we were near the end of the pool, so there was only about three tons of backlash when it happened. Jesus Christ. Okay. Most of the men I worked with had some sort of permanent injury, lost fingers, blown shoulders or knees, etc. The more experienced, the more injuries. Even in our suits connected to refrigerated air, it was more than 100 degrees in full saturation humidity. It's pitch black everywhere down here, so you rely on your helmet lights, work lights, and the rig lights to be able to see. Uh, they all give everything a sickly shine. Working down here isn't all like, at all like in a cave or a mine. Everything is wet, slippery, and disgusting and miserable. Nothing is flat or walkable. And you have to fight a feeling of raw, animalistic terror every moment you're out in it. Men weren't meant to be down here in the innards of the monster, but I figured that's why the company pays people what they do. I finished up my contract without injury, and for that I consider myself extremely lucky. 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 I took the money and got an education. Most people don't consider it exciting work, but you'll never find a more satisfied accountant. I never went back there, especially after the big accident they had in 2007. 
But there are a lot of stupid kids that still do that kind of work. You sound like a smart kid. Stay the hell away from it. That's my career advice for you. Let me know if you need anything else for your school report. Thanks, Andre Martinez. Or Andre Martinez. God. Damn. I feel like that's going to be the uh, the catchphrase for this stream. is just God damn after every single thing I read. Because. God damn. It's. God, it's so well written. This entire thing is just so well written. And I, I do actually want some merch. <laughs> I want some mystery flash print merchandise for Christmas. I would love that. Oh, uh, and like an anodyne hat or like a mystery flesh pit hat. That would be amazing. Anyway. Let's go back to whatever the hell this is. <laughs> oh my god. Okay. Okay, we've looked at that. We looked at that. We've looked at that. We have not looked at this. We've not looked at this. We've not looked at this or this. I want to look at this. This, this. You know what? Just open all the things. Just open all the things. Let's fucking go. Open all the... Oh. Texans for tomorrow. <laughs> okay. Oh, you know what? It popped this up on screen. Let's see what this is. People say that heavy industry is in a woman's place, but I love my job. The PBRC has given me the confidence to overcome any preconceived ideas about who I am and where I'm going. This November, help us eliminate the, the oppressive Bush-era bureaucratic regulation that is currently strangling our ability to provide jobs and prosperity to the disadvantaged communities of the South Plains. Okay, so this is just like uh, anodyne propaganda advertisement. Gotcha. Okay. Let's see. Oh, this is the Red Wildlife Safety Brochure. Oh, dude. I want to read this. We're going to read all of it, but I want to read this particularly. Wildlife safety within the flesh pit. Your visit to the mystery flesh pit, flesh pit can be a most pleasurable and rewarding experience, or it can be a time of vexation, distress, or even tragedy. That's great advertising right there. <laughs> Much depends on how you and your family observe these simple guidelines and avoid designated hazards. Take a minute to read these simple but important safety rules, and then go on a pleasant park experience. Visitors and wildlife within the mystery flesh pit often frequent the same areas within the park. It is likely that park wildlife and visitors will encounter one another. But by remaining calm and following the basic advice of experienced Ventario biologists, you increase the odds of a positive outcome for both yourself and the wildlife. Before you go, all visitors who partake on self-guided excursions beyond reinforced or enclosed trails within the mystery flesh pit are required to attend an orientation at the lower visitor center. During this orientation, a park ranger will inform you about areas that are closed to visitors due to high fauna activity or recent wildlife human encounters. It is important to be aware when camping or hiking within the mystery flesh pit to avoid wildlife foraging areas, such as chymal deposits, gastric bladders, surface wildlife carcass mounds, etc. <sighs> God, contact park staff to obtain a current information on wildlife safety issues. No, once inside the greater anatomy of the pit, rangers may be able to assist you, but ultimately you are on your own. Oh my God. Uh. Oh. I think that's the greatest horror of like spelunking or diving or mining or caving or anything like that. Or flesh pitting, I guess. Uh, it's, it's that line right there. You are on your own. Like, oh my god. I think that's the most terrifying thing. It's just being on a situation where no one can help you and you are on your own. That's just... I don't know. That, that puts some heart in my heart. <laughs> Here we are. Fungal growth. While not typically considered wildlife, large fungal... Hold on, let me... Can I open this in another tab? Oh, I could do that. 
While not typically considered wildlife, large fungal colonies are commonly encountered throughout the mystery flesh pit and should be treated as potentially dangerous. Many varieties of fungal growths exist native to the pit, uh, though they all share a few common characteristics, characteristics such as proximity to amniotic spring fluid bladders as well as spores, which are toxic to humans, Park staff routinely prune known fungal outcroppings, which attempt to grow near developed areas of human activity. But visitors should remain alert so as to not accidentally stumble or fall into a colony. Compound surface fauna. What a fucking icon. That is a horrifying icon to have. On rare occasions, abyssal copepods and other park wildlife will venture outside of the pit and pull surface animals such as deer, livestock, coyote, and rabbits into the mystery flesh pit. If not eaten by park fauna, these animals may undergo a fascinating phenomenon known as anatomical amalgamation. This process, which is not fully understood by park scientists, results in the creation of a compound organism, which is a hybrid of constituent surface animals. No two of these amalgamations are the same. Those are the so the Though, the resulting physiology often results in similar conditions such as partial fusing of major body elements and relocation of internal organs to locations on the exterior of the body. Because of the gruesome and seemingly haphazard nature of these combinations, many compound surface fauna do not live beyond a few hours or days from the time when they are discovered. Should you encounter a shambling compound surface fauna, please do not feed it or otherwise engage in activity which could prolong its suffering. Note, in the extremely unlikely event that you encounter an amalgamation containing one or more human constituent organisms, contact a park ranger immediately via one of the emergency telephones installed along trail routes. Macrobacteria The most common organism encountered by park visitors during excursions into the park are the various subspecies of macrobacteria. While resembling their microscopic counterparts, these creatures are multicellular and reach sizes of up to 12 feet across. The feeding mechanisms of macrobacteria is believed to be related to cystic nutrient ganglions found in the mystery flesh pit around the macrobacteria congregate in substantial numbers. Osmotic diffusion of proteins, lipids, and minerals from within these ganglia into the macrobacteria appear to drive their asexual reproduction capability. Macrobacteria often migrate in colonies consisting of many dozens of individuals throughout feeding areas and the pit's anatomy. Imagine walking on a pit, walking in on a pit trail, and there's just a pile of amoeba. That just slither across the ground right in front of you. I guess it is what it is. Oh my god. Though generally passive in nature, macrobacteria are aggressively territorial of feeding zones and pose a risk to human life through suffocation via an oral groove or through caustic, bifur caustic bifurcation. Jesus. Caustic bifurcation. And then, of course, there is the abyssal copepod. I don't like how they gave it human hands. I don't like how it has human gribby grab hands. That's a bit fucked. As the name suggests, abyssal copepods tend to avoid lights, machinery, and other human activity wherever possible, preferring to reside in deeper areas within the mystery flesh pit. Unlike macrobacteria, abyssal copepods are predatory and survive by hunting other life forms within the pit. These unusual arthropods have hard chitinous carapaces coated in a waxy secretion, which allows them to easily slip and travel within the pit while remaining somewhat protected from conventional deterrents such as firearms and electric discharge weapons. Abyssal copepods are considered hazardous to the safety and well being of park staff, park visitors, as well as commercial mining operations within Mystery Flesh Pit National Park. Oh my god, it's a finger shrimp. It is a finger shrimp. We got a pistol shrimp and we have a finger shrimp. Oh boy, get ready to move your pingors. Pingors. Anyway. 
basic safety tips. As the number of visitors to the mystery flesh... Oh. Oh. An adult copepod emerges from a barrow. Oh. Oh. I don't like it. Get it off screen. <laughs> As the number of visitors to the mystery flesh pit increases, so does the number of human wildlife counters. The vast... The vast majority of these encounters do not result in wildlife injury or fatality. You can help prevent injury to yourself, to others, and to park infrastructure by taking a few basic precautions. Minimize disturbance of anatomical fauna. If you see flora or fauna... Oh god, it's back on screen. Ugh, get it out of here! <sighs> if you move... Out hold on, hold on, wait a minute, wait a minute, whoa, 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 hold on. Hold on, we can do this. Image. Add source. Add a new source. Add source. Browse. Oh god. It's still on screen. Get it out of here. Uh backgrounds. SpongeBob. Hans. There we go. Hans. Please. Hans, save us. Why are you vertical? I don't know. He's just gonna cover that. There you go. Ah, sweet release. Thank you, Hans. <laughs> oh my god, thank you, Hans. <laughs> oh, when in doubt, just and de deploy the Hans. Can I, ro can I rotate you? Hold on. Can I rotate this? I want to rotate Hans. There we go. Hans, save us. Ah, uh, it's perfect. It's perfect. Thank you, Hans. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's perfect. I'm so happy. All right, there we go. Perfect. <sighs> if you see flora or fauna within the park and it does not appear to notice you, back out of sight and change your course. Move out of the area or quickly observe at a safe distance without approaching or otherwise disturbing it. Disturbance is evident whatever wildlife changed their behavior because of you. If it stops eating and looks up slash raises its antenna and secretes scent enzymes or begins making territorial clicks uh, while you are, while trying to locate you, you are too close. While many life forms within the pet seem to be tolerant of human presence, at distances farther than 200 yards, each creature is different. Use telephoto lenses and endoscopes whenever possible, or where possible. Allow migrating bacterial colonies to pass by your camp undisturbed. If you have made sure that the wildlife is aware of your presence so it, so, so it is not surprised and have kept all of your gear under your direct control, Allow any organism you encounter to travel unhindered. You may just be afforded the opportunity to safely observe these safely safely observe these natural creatures in their natural environment. <laughs> what are we censoring? It popped out and now there's a hand. Oh, we are censoring the uh uh the uh the abyssal copepod an adult abyssal copepod which i do not like the look of because it is horrifying so i'm just covering it up i don't care i don't like it <laughs> i don't like it so hans is protecting us thank you hans all right all right Exercise proper equipment handling. Do not leave equipment unattended. This includes stent frames, tents, climbing cleats, bottle, water bottles, and weapons. Uh, consider using a portable electric fence to discourage aggressive wildlife, such as copepods from investigating your camp. In areas with damage to amniotic bladders, minimize the amount of fluid that contaminates your gear and clothes. Many life forms within the pit have extraordinary senses of smell and depend on phosphoproteins within the fluid in order to survive. Some will attempt to hunt you if they smell strong concentrations on your persons or equipment. Okay. Oh, God. Hans. Hans. Okay, thank you. All right. Thank you, Hans. Your services are no longer required. 
Bleeding Bone Marrow. What a what a name. All right, wildlife safety brochure. Though the Mystery Flesh Pit National Park remained a model of, for visitor safety until the disaster which led to its closure, the natural hazards of the pit necessitated guests being aware of the nature of the attraction they were descending into. This brochure combined with the mandatory three-minute orientation uh, la, 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 film shown in the lower visitors... Just three minutes? Three-minute orientation film shown in the lower visitor center was intended to act as a minimum standard of readiness for inexperienced park guests. Park service staff, rangers, and anodyne mining personnel received much more in-depth training as part of their operations within the pit. Oh, boy. It's gross. Oh, get out of here. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. There's so much to read. Look at the hands peeking out. It's coming for you. It's going to give you the grubby grab. Yeah, he is. You know what? I'm going to give him the grubby, back, grubby grab back. What? Well, bam There he is. Hello, Hans. Entry Orifice and Services Guide. God, I am not reading all of this. I'm sorry, guys. I am not reading all of this. Because good fucking lord. <laughs> oh, I'm pretty sure this is just a ton of information that we've already looked over anyway. But it is cool to see, like, one of the brochures. Oh, yeah, there's the chilies, too. And the Borgor King. The Mystery Flesh Pit National Park trail map was published in 1981. It was the first mapping of the superorganism to conform to the MPS graphic standards. Early trail maps were compiled from hundreds of individual surveys and measurements by spelunkers, explorers, and eventually park engineers to form a more comprehensive picture of the Mystery Flesh Pit's internal anatomy. With the addition of lighted and air-conditioned reinforced tunnels in the late 1970s, the park became more accessible to visitors than ever, necessitating the need for a concise, easy-to-read map familiar to any national park visitor. The addition shown here is, for, is, is scan from 2000. Wait, the addition the shown here is scan is... The edition shown here is scan is from 2000. Okay, that's a little bit of a typo, I think. Okay, but yeah, I thought when it said like uh, 1981, I thought that this Burger King logo was a little too modern. And yeah, it's because this this brochure is from 2000. It commemorates the 20th anniversary of the park's absorption ugh, into the national park system. Notable additions to this park to this map over other prints older prints are the hilton intrapark thermal wellness resort as well as redrawn property lines of commercial extraction areas the monorail line is notably missing from this map and its development would not be announced to the public until may of 2001 only to finally open after dozens of delays in the autumn of 2006 oops just one year before the thing and re-uploaded this because several small tweaks and changes to continuity. Okay. Come on. Mystery Flesh Pit National Park. Evolution of park signage. Oh, cool. All right. Let's see how their signs changed over time. So, 1973. And, oh my, oh wait, okay, so hold on. Oh, 1973 is the discovery and development of the pit. And then there's the Mystery Flesh Pit. Oh my god. 76, Anodyne Incorporated opens the Mystery Flesh Pit to the general public. Oh my god. Uh, 1980, the Special Resources Development Act passes in 1980, absorbing the park into the national park system. Oh, and then 2007 to present, park is permanently closed and quarantined. So let's go ahead and read some of this. Because I know that Pat was a little bit interested in uh maybe it's uh if it enthralls things. So let's see. Attention. 
Extreme danger. Stop. This area has been quarantined for your safety. Fact. Over 582 people have died attempting to commune with the superorganism. Fact. The U.S. government is un and unable to rescue individuals trapped by the superorganism. Fact. You will not receive a quote-unquote gift from the superorganism. Fact. You will find no answers beyond this fence. There is nothing beyond this fence worth dying over. Dying for. So, yeah, Pat, uh, here you go. Uh, this sign is a little bit interesting. And uh, I think I know what the inspiration for this sign was. Hold on. Yeah, here it is. So, I believe that uh, this sign right here um, is inspired by this sign. This is a real-life sign, by the way, that exists in an underwater cave. And it says, stop, prevent your death, go no farther. Fact. More than 300 divers, including open water scuba instructors have, instructors, have died in caves just like this one. Fact. You need training to dive. You need cave training and quave cave equipment to cave dive. Fact. Without cave training and dive equipment, divers can die here. Fact. It can happen to you. There is nothing in this cave worth dying for. Do not go beyond this point. And this, this is a real-life sign. This is real. This is a real life sign in an actual underwater cave. So I think that this sign was uh, inspired by that. So it calls to people then? Um, it calls to certain people who have interacted with the pit the most. We'll get to that when we... Actually, no, we can get to that now. So essentially, um... They didn't discover the, uh, I think we read this last time, but they didn't discover the, uh, the prolonged, what a prolonged exposure to, uh, amniotic ballast would do to people. And, uh, people would go into withdrawals because they weren't getting their doses of, uh, the ballast that they had become addicted to when the, uh, the flesh pit closed. So, uh, people would, I guess, quote unquote, be enthralled by the pit. And uh, it, it will be outlined in the 2007 report later on. But there were people that were, like, trying to crawl back into the pit. So uh, we'll get to that when we get to that. But just know that um, something fucky goes on with the pit. So, following its accidental discovery, the mystery flesh pit and the unique phenomena surrounding it were targets of a headfirst and furiously paced campaign of commercial exploitation. Once architects, engineers, geobiologists, and clerical members of the development team had done their work to make the park safe and viable, marketing teams faced the daunting task of selling the public on the intriguing and miraculous phenomena of the mystery flesh pit while downplaying the visceral cosmic horror of the pit itself. So this is just a bunch of pictures and lore. I'm trying to understand, but like, where's the game? Ha, ah, the game. I don't know why it's called an ARG. I don't know why. Now, there are a lot of ARGs that are actual games. Like, uh, Game Theory has done a few, like, real-life ARGs. And another ARG was actually for, uh... Uh, oh god, Gravity Falls. Um, they had, like, uh, they had, like, the main antagonist, like, a statue of the main antagonist somewhere in the world, and there were clues hidden throughout the episode, and whoever found the statue, like, won a prize or something. Um, but that, that was an ARG. An ARG is an augmented reality game. It's essentially a game that takes place in the real world, but ARG stories are often stories that are presented as if they are happening in real life in the real world, but they're entirely fictitious. I don't know why these stories that are not interactive are called ARGs, but they are. Uh, there are certain ARGs that are stories that you can sort of guide the direction that the story goes in. 
and those could be considered like ARGs. But again, uh, no one is exactly influencing what the pit, how the story of the pit, how the lore development of the pit goes. So I don't know why it's called an ARG, but I that's the only applicable term that I could find other than horror story. So there you go. I don't know why. Yeah, it is just lore like stuff. Exactly. It is just lore stuff. Now, there is a little bit of interactivity with uh, certain fans. Uh, there have been Q&As, um, which the people would ask questions, and uh, they would answer these questions, uh, like, in-universe. Um, so I guess you could consider that part the ARG, but other than that, no. It's not an interactive thing. It's just a bunch of lore. Uh, families were particularly difficult to sell, as children often displayed an overwhelming fear and aversion to descending into the throat of the pit. One strategy early on in the park's history was the creation of friendly cartoon mascot Caver Coop. A brief animated film starring Caver Coop was shown at the park's visitor center, where the character would attempt to assuage worries about being eaten alive or swallowed, reassuring children and often parents that the pit was perfectly safe and reinforced. Oh wait, you know what? I think I've read this. Yeah, we read this last time. We read this last time. Anyway. And we read this too. Wildlife Incident Report. And then they, they made this... The author of this made this entire, like, professional-looking form. Until it wasn't... Oh, God. I don't want the mystery flesh pit to be real. I don't want to drink Coca-Cola heartthrob. I'm good. I don't need any of that shit. As any park ranger could tell you, no volume of safeguards or training will prevent a park guest from interfering with wildlife. The notoriously dangerous environment of the Mystery Flesh Pit National Park necessitated a highly specialized corps of rangers to respond to incidents involving wildlife and to guest safety. But this was often not enough to prevent tragedy. With the 2007 closure of the Mystery Flesh Pit, removing much of the context surrounding the activities within the former park, it is easy to look at these sorts of ephemeral traces of hazard management with a sense of detached wisdom that mischaracterizes the fundamental draw of the park in the first place. The danger was a heavily marketed inherent inherent thrill, and a major attractor of visitors. It was the management of those hazards which presented the real and insidious problem of the pit. See, so yeah, look at this pit. Look at, look at this pit form. Wildlife involve amorphous sham, amoebic organism, bat, bone mite, deer, eagle, elk, shamble, Polyp, gasp owl, gastric, gastric manatee. The fuck is a gastric, gastric whale? What are these? What are those? What are any of those? What is a gastric whale? I want to know about gastric whales. That sounds interesting. <laughs> a gastric manatee and a gastric whale. Imagine going down to the flesh pit and you just see a fucking whale. All right, moving on. Oh, here we are. Some pictures of the flesh pit. This guy looks so fucking happy to be here. He looks so thrilled. <laughs> oh, God, the walls are made of flesh. Imagine. I hate it. I hate it. Anodyne. Oh, this is uh, one of the um, the fucking IDs. Oh, and it's covered in blood. How lovely. An overview of presentation of the 1979 survey expedition into the mystery flesh pit. Oh. Oh, shit. This is just like a 10-minute film. Uh... Okay, cool. I'll take a break from reading. Yeah, sure. Let's go. Oh. 
Oh, it's not letting me full screen it. Let's full screen this on YouTube. <laughs> There's a whole fucking YouTube video about this. Holy shit. Let's go. In 1979, a mission was proposed uh, to study and map the gross anatomical structure of the Permian Basin superorganism through a mandered vertical descent. This surveying expedition was a joint effort administered by the United States Department of the Interior in cooperation with the Soviet Academy of Sciences. The six-person expedition team, consisting of three American and three Soviet personnel, spent nearly six weeks in the depths of the superorganism, conducting a wide battery of scientific observations and measurements. Despite tragedies and hardships faced by the crew during the mission, the wealth of information collected by the project has been instrumental in the fields of geobiology, venteriology, material science, psychology, medicine, and venterial engineering. Break from reading, you thought! <laughs> Background. The Permian Basin superorganism was discovered in 1973 by Jillian Cruz, who believed to have found an untapped aquifer. Excavation of a small nearby sinkhole revealed a colossal living portal of flesh descending into the earth. Workers began referring to the orifice site as the mystery flesh pit. Over the next three years, from 1973 to 1976, scattered explorations efforts slowly began to map and understand the large internal sections of the Permian Basin superorganism. Oh, God. Oh, so these were like photographs they took. While widespread knowledge of and interest in the Permian Basin superorganism maintained low remained low in the general academic landscape of the Soviet Union at the time, Dr. Kazimir Vinogordov, oh god, of the, uh, I'm sorry for butchering that name, of the Soviet Academy of Science was a vocal proponent of study of the superorganism for its potential insights to the origin of early evolution of life. In December of 1977, Soviet Academy of Science's president, Anatoly Alekstranov, uh, con uh, responded to U.S. Department of the Interior Secretary Cecil B. Andrus's letter proposing a cooperative geobiological expedition, and there was subsequently a meeting between Dr. Vinogradov's uh, team and members of the United States Department of the Interior to discuss technical details. Yeah, I thought this was going to be narrated, and it's not. <laughs> Uh, program objectives. Broadly, the goal of the Joint Anatomical Expedition was to expand geobiological and venterial understanding of the Permian Basin superorganism. God damn it, I knew that was going to happen eventually. With the un ultimate goal of lowering a human into the deepest extents of the organism. Aside from the prestige of being the first human beings to make such a deep journey, the partnership held the following objectives for the Joint Anatomical Expedition and furtherance of its geobiological research. Expedition objectives. Precise determination of the anatomical structure throughout a vertical section of the Permian Basin superorganism. Bioseismic measurements from a deeper reference depth of the de depth the bioseismic measurements from a deeper reference depth than any prior measurements. Distribution and diversity of parasitic fauna at both charted and char and uncharted depths. Engineering tests of equipment at great anatomical depths. Geobiological study of the exotic anatomy environment located in the deepest known extents of the superorganism. Determination of the effects of occult venterial phenomena on human health and psychology. Key expedition personnel. Oh my lord. Uh, oh, this is Dr. Casimir Vin 
Vinogradov, uh, Chief of Geo's Physical Research, Soviet Academy of Sciences, Geobiological Research Scientist, Expedition Commander. Although there has been historical disinterest among the scientific societies of the USSR in regards to geobiology, Dr. Vinogradov's uh, early research into theoretical effects of geobiological activity upon surrounding rock strata has been instrumental in the development of early warning systems developed for the Permian Basin region. During the planning of the expedition, Dr. Vinogradov uh, directly oversaw the development of the Coronet expedition vehicle. Uh, his primary uh, research interest uh, during the expedition was in constructing sonic and x-ray imaging of deep anatomical structures of the superorganism. God, I need water. Water. I thought this was going to be a break from breeding. <laughs> He's staring into our souls. <laughs> He's just looking like, nope. Dr. Cole, uh, uh, Colonel, um, I don't know. Uh, Nikolai Morozov, field engineer, Soviet Army expedition engineer. Colonel Nikolai Morozov is distinguished for his services throughout the USSR. Antarctic program on a variety of roles involving hostile environment management. As a member of the Joint Anatomical Expedition, his duties involved maintaining the Corona vehicle and providing security logistics in the events of hostile wildlife encounters. Lieutenant Valeria, God, I'm so, I don't know how to say that last name, pilot, uh, Soviet uh, Air Force's expedition vehicle pilot. Lieutenant whatever her name is, uh, began her aviation career at 13 years old flying roll parcel delivery before joining the Soviet Air Forces. After a rapid series of promotions, she became the youngest person in the program's history to be selected for a Soviet cosmonaut corps. For the Soviet cosmonaut corps. Tragically, an ankle injury uh, sustained during training forced her resignation from the program. She has since fulfilled a variety of roles within the sphere of vehicle testing and holds the record for the deepest hard suit dive in the Arctic Ocean. She was selected by the Soviet Academy of Sciences to pilot the experimental exotic tissue excursion pod through the blue tissue layered into the exotic anatomy itself. This is some real lore. We're getting... We're getting, like, actual names of people here. James Slippin' Jim Jackson! There he is! Owner slash President Jackson Surveying LLC Navigation Expedition Second in Command. Self-described as an adventurer and explorer, Mr. Jackson's early explorations of the Permian Basin superorganism provided much of the groundwork upon which all subsequent investigations have been based. Uh, despite no formally even discernible academic backgrounds, Mr. Jackson remains an indisputed expert on navigating the internal anatomy of the Permian Basin superorganism through what he attests is cowboy intuition. Look at him. It's slipping Jim Jackson, baby. Look at him. Look at that smile. Look at that Texas sun in his eyes. Uh, Gualtiero Ortiz. Uh, surveying Engineer, Jackson Surveying, LLC. And Mr. Ortiz is a close associate of James Jackson, who began working with him five years before the discovery of the Permian Basin superorganism. As an aide to Mr. Jackson, Mr. Ortiz is a capable ventarial navigator and engineer, having designed many of the instruments used by pioneering explorers of the superorganism. During the surveying expedition, his oversight of the complex radiometric surveying instrumentation provided maps for an extraordinary, of an extraordinary clarity and detail which are still used by the National Park Service today. Look at this man. Rachel Frost, PhD candidate, Chief of Ventarial Research, University of Texas, Ventarial Research Scientist, Expedition Medic. Rachel Frost pioneered the field of Ventarial Biology while a biology student at the University of Texas, and, was, and has published an extensive catalog of research surrounding the Permian Basin superorganism. The primary focus of her research during the expedition survey uh, concentrated in 
on evaluating possible effects of quartz mineral harmonics Oh my god, on general metabolic processes of the superorganism and conducting tests to determine neurocognitive capabilities of the superorganism. As a long time highly vocal critic of human activity within the superorganism, her inclusion in this expedition was possible through only through recommendation by both Dr. Vinogradov and Mr. Jackson. Expedition outline. Location of Permian Basin Superorganism. Okay, cool. We're actually getting into the mission details. October 12, 1979. Expedition Day 1. Corona vehicles lowered into mauve entry orifice and affixed for crew arrival. Oh, look at that. It's a butt plug. No, that's rude. Uh, oh my god. Look at these amazing... Look, look, the artist. The author, the artist, whoever made this. Look at the rich detail they have put into this fictitious world. Like, look at this. You would not see me put this much effort into anything I work on. And here are these people... Making this. This is amazing. I have, I am nothing but impressed by the mystery flesh pit. October 12th, 1979. 480 meters below surface. Okay. I'm not going back. This is just a lot of shit. Oh my god. The expedition team continues the descent over the next two weeks, cataloging a variety of material samples while performing surveying operations. Crew reaches 10 kilometer depth milestone. Oh my god. This thing is fucking huge. Encounter with previously unobserved macro parasitic parasitic life form. Organism flees before extensive documentation is able to occur. Oh! Oh, look at that! Look at that fucking thing! Corona vehicle breaches the meso mesogliatic firm firmament chasm. Mesogliatic firmament chasm. An advanced base camp is established as preparations are made to begin blasting through a dense cartilage stratum plate at the base of the chasm. Jesus. They're already like a month into the expedition. Good lord. Oh my god, what the hell is that? With the blue tissue exposed through blasting, the excursion pod vehicle is slowly lowered down into the cut. There it goes. <laughs> there it goes. Look at the rich detail they put into this. Good lord. The single-person excursion vehicle is piloted by Lieutenant uh, Valeria. After approximately four hours, the vehicle passes into a yet unknown area of PBSO anatomy following a brief instrument calibration test. Lieutenant, I'm sorry, uh, reports her findings via radio interference with the transmission results and an incomplete message. Are we going to hear the message? Are we going to hear the message? Oh, it's just a transcript. Come on. I don't want to read everything. I can't read that anyway. <laughs> what am I complaining about? I can't read that. No voice acting for you. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, there we go. Translated. Light, reflective and mixing, tessellation, movement of coarse tissue, prismatic behavior, becomes like a fractal, will continue to collect a sample of the material. Okay. No voice acting for you. Light. 
Ooh. Photo plate of exotic anatomical environment re uh, recovered from excursion pod vehicle onboard imaging system. Look at that. It's pretty. Exotic anatomy sample recovered from exurge vehicle. Okay. Sample collection rack. After spending five minutes within the exotic anatomy, the excursion pod vehicle begins an automatic ascent, up, ascent upward through the blue tissue. During this time, transmission interference prevents radio contact with the pilot and the corona vehicle. Okay. At approximately 4.51 a.m. CST, a sharp tensile force is observed by the Corona crew on the cables pulling up the excursion pod at vehicle. A general alarm signal originating from the excursion pod vehicle is recorded. Pond descent operations continue at an increased pace. Uh-oh. At 6.02 a.m. CST, the excursion pod vehicle surfaces from the blue tissue cut and is hoisted upward via attachment cables. Though the onboard instrumentation is intact, the Pyrex canopy has been shattered inward. The pilot is absent with the exception of trace amounts of human blood located on the canopy shards. A search is deemed impossible without an operational blue tissue capable vehicle. Lieutenant... Oh, the lieutenant is presumed dead. Shit! What the fuck happened? Oh my god, what the fuck happened? A single photo is recovered from the excursion vehicle onboard imaging system. Dated to mere moments before the tensile load event, the photograph depicts an unknown organism approximately 500 meters in width floating within the blue tissue layer. Judging from the intense damage to the excursion pod vehicle, it is determined that an attack by this unknown organism was the probable cause of the lieutenant's death. Oh my god, 500 meters in width! What the fuck is that? <laughs> A decision is made by the remaining Corona crew to abandon any additional survey activities and begin the return journey back to the surface. Aided by a series of cleat stations installed during the prior descent, the ascent voyage is completed in 22 days without major incident. On December 6th of 1979, the Corona vehicle and crew arrive at the lower base camp facility. Conclusion the enormous expense of the program, as well as the death of the lieutenant, persuades the Soviet Academy of Scientists to discontinue any... God damn it. Oh, what have I done? No! I reset it! Come on. There we are. To discontinue any future activities involving the Permian Basin superorganism. Despite this, the project was considered a diplomatic and scientific success. The results of the expedition are used to justify the absorption of site into federal control as the Permian Basin Superorganism Natural Preserve, though it eventually will become known by the public as the Mystery Flesh Pit National Park. End of presentation. God. Well, there we go. There we go. There indeed we go. How much more of this do I have? Eh, a little bit more. Trevor Roberts is creating illness. Oh, this is the this is the person's Patreon. Yeah, let's take a look at their Patreon. Yeah, look at that. Trevor Roberts is creation creating fictitious worlds. Or fictional worlds. Look at that. What's their their Patreon? Okay, let's. I'm gonna put the Patreon into the chat. Yeah, uh, by all means, uh, support this person because uh, 
This is a really fucking cool story that they've created. I love this. Oh my god, is there even more shit on Patreon? Am I gonna have to become a patron so I can see these uh, mystery flesh pit uh, fucking posts? Yeah, probably. But I'm probably not gonna stream any of that stuff. Look at this. Yeah, this is the Patreon. Uh, Venterial. Oh my god, what is this? Okay, like many aspects of the mystery flesh pit, the more visceral reality of the pit was usually glossed in a more clinical veneer by the professionals who studied and worked within it. This treatment extended to the often cryptic vocabulary used to refer to different elements and fields of activity surrounding the pit. Shown here is a chart which illustrates the differences and similarities between these interconnected scientific, political, and commercial fields. Oh my god. Oh. Okay. This is a chart for smart people. And I'm not one of those. <laughs> so, uh, I can't exactly, uh... Uh, extrapolate on whatever the hell this is, but this is the chart for smart people, I guess. Because I don't fucking know any of this. Alright, moving on. Meet the mesoglial tridecapod. Mesoglial tridecapod. Oh, dear lord. That is a horrifying looking thing. 13 footed. 13 footed. Ugh. I'm good. Though commonly considered a nuisance animal, the mesoglial tridecapod is a fascinating species which plays an important role in the unique ecosystem of Mystery Flesh Pit National Park by filtering out potentially harmful blood based parasites. Oh my god, this thing is fucking huge compared to a person. Tridecapods are so named because of their 13 legs, 12 of which are elongated and used for locomotion, with a 13th modified leg plating, plated in durable uh, keratinous segments used as a head. These quasi-vertebrates pose no threats to humans, and despite their fearsome appearance, they are non-venomous and passive, tending to congregate around high-voltage areas associated with park infrastructure. Oh, so they like zip-zap stuff. They like electricity. Like, uh, my throat is starting to hurt, and I still have the entire 2007 incident report to read. So I'm going to just gloss over this. But look at this thing. Look at the level of detail that they have put into fleshing out this world. Like, this creature in particular. It's amazing. All right. Mystery Fleshpin National Park. Oh, it's a badge. I want a badge. Sold out, gone forever. Fuck! <laughs> Fuck! Really? Shit. Well, shit. Never mind. I guess I won't get a badge. Oh, well. And we've already seen this advertisement. Yeah, this is the tourism poster. Oh, and with that, that's everything. We have read everything except for Q&A number three. It is time, everyone. It is time for the main event. The coup de, cra coup de gras of the entire thing. Oh, my, my clothes are all messed up. It is time for the 2007 disaster report. Get ready because this is a long incident report. Uh, this is probably going to take like a whole 40 minutes to read. Uh, if anyone would like, if anyone in the chat who, like, uh, is a part of the Discord would like to join me in voice for this, feel free to go ahead because my voice is starting to feel like a little bit like murder. But you don't have to. It's time for the incident, the the uh, the major catastrophe that closed down the entire park. Here we go. 
final incident investigation report prepared in cooperation with the U.S. Department of the Interior, the National Park Service, and the what the fuck? <laughs> I have joined you. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> Scared the hell out of me. All right. I, jo I joined you in case you needed a speaker because I, I felt bad for your voice dying. <laughs> it's all right. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put the link to it in staff chat. Oh, okay, sounds good. Sounds so you can good. follow along. Anyway, how are you tonight, Captain? I'm good. How are you? I'm all right. Whenever you do, you want me to go ahead and take over, and I'll read for you. Um, and you can give your your uh, voice a bit of a break and drink some water. Sure, go ahead. Okay. Uh, where did you leave off? I am so sorry. The very beginning. Oh, excellent. Okay. <clears throat> Final incident investigation report. Prepared in cooperation with the U.S. Government of the Interior, the National Park Service, and the U.S. Geological Survey, U.S. Commission on Geobiological Resources and Public Safety, U.S. Geological Survey, U.S. <laughs> Department of the Interior, National Park Service, <clears throat> the U.S. Commission on Geobiological Resources and Public Safety, CGR, is an independent federal agency whose mission is to ensure the safety of workers, the public, and the environment by instigating... Investigating. <laughs> instigating. Hell yeah. Poke the pit with a stick. <laughs> by investigating and preventing accidents relating to the Permian Basin superorganism. So the CGR is a scientific investigative organization. It is not an enforcement or regulatory body. Established by the Special Resources Development Act of 1980, the CGR is responsible for determining the route and the contributing causes of accidents, issuing safety recommendations, studying ge geobiological safety issues, and evaluating, evaluating the effectiveness of other government agencies and private enterprises involved with the Permian Basin superorganism. No part of the conclusions, findings, or recommendations of the CGR relating to any incident may be admitted as evidence or used in any action or suit for damages. C-4-2-U-S-C, or U-S-C, <clears throat> 7412, registered trade, or not registered trademark, what's the R with the circle mean? Registered. Registered. 6-G. The CGR makes public its actions and decisions through investigation reports, summary reports, safety bulletins, safety recommendations. Can, blah, blah, recommendations. It's all right. I've been doing that all night. <laughs> I've been doing that all night. I'm trying so hard to have like that default like women's uh, report voice, and yeah. I was getting it, and then I lost my words. That's okay. <laughs> I've been doing that all night. <laughs> <laughs> the CGR makes public its actions. Decisions through investigation reports, summary reports, safety bulletins, safety recommendations, case studies, incident digests, special technical publications, and statistical reviews. Any use of trade, firm, or product names is for descriptive purposes only and does not imply endorsement by the U.S. government. U.S. Commission on Geobiological Resources and Public Safety, Office of Congressional Public and Board Affairs, 217K Street, Northwest Washington, D.C., 2037. Dash one eight four eight. Figure, instant area map, map. Yep, <laughs> map. <laughs> yeah, hey. there it is. Uh, this is um, where the this is this the entire flesh pit. That circle is um, the range of initial effects that uh, this incident had. Oh. So, as you can see, it's fucking huge. It is huge. Jeezly Pete's. All right, one dot one dot. Oh wait, that was a zero. One point zero point zero. zero, zero. Yeah. Executive summary: At nine forty one p.m. Central Standard Time on July fourth, two thousand seven, the Permian Basin Superorganism Natural Preserve, known colloquially as the Mystery Flesh Pit National Park, experienced a catastrophic disaster which resulted in over seven hundred and fifty fatalities and over one thousand eight hundred major injuries. In the weeks following the incident, approximately 18,000 individuals from the surrounding communities sought medical and psychological treatment for ailments including breathing problems, chest pains, shortness of breath, nausea, birth defects, hallucinations, depression, anxiety, internal bleeding, sore throat, and headaches. As a direct, I should have read that like a commercial for a medicine. As a direct <laughs> yeah. result of contact with gastric ejecta. So it threw up. It threw up, yeah. It threw Ew. up. 
which had been introduced to the atmosphere. Investigators have concluded that this disaster was chiefly characterized by a premature geologic, ge, geobiological consumption event caused by the catastrophic failure of critical park infrastructure to constrain and limit the gastric, motor, and neurological actions of the Permian Basin superorganism. Investigators have concluded that the failure of these critical safety measures are the direct result of negligent practices by the primary site operations contractor, Anodyne Deep Earth Mining, a subsidiary of Anodyne Inc., the U.S. Commission on Geobiological Resources and Public Safety, CGR, released its first report in the Permian Basin on the Permian Basin Superorganism Disaster in August 2007, the interim report, which highlighted technical findings and safety system deficiencies. The report issued recommendations to Anodyne Inc., the city of Gumption, Texas, the state of Texas, the U.S. Department of the Interior, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, and the U.S. Department of Energy. As of April 2008, these groups have made progress in implementing the recommendations to improve the regulatory re re requirements for geobiological resource extraction, geobiological resource containment, and general public safety as it relates to the Permian Basin superorganism. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> 2.1.0, Anodyne Background. Anodyne was originally founded as the Anchor Mineral Company in 1923. In 1958, the Anchor Mineral Company merged with Dynamic Equipment LLC to form a new company known as Anodyne Deep Earth Mining, later, later changed to Anodyne. Headquartered in Arlington, Texas, of course it'd be Arlington, and prior to its 2008 restructuring, Anodyne Corporation was the 23rd largest American company by revenue. Globally, Anodyne employed over 28,000 people. It operated seven major research, development, and, repro and reproductive <laughs> and production <laughs> facilities throughout the world. I've been doing this all night. <laughs> Six of which were in the United States. Anodyne filed for bankruptcy in late 2008, but ended its bankruptcy in February 2009 pursuant to a court-approved plan of reorganization. A new board of directors changed the name of Anodyne to the Permian Basin Recovery and Superorganism Containment Corporation and emphasized reorganizing and liquidating certain operations and assets of the pre-bankruptcy Anodyne. Oh. Oh, also, you had some messages in chat, Jagum. Yep, I do. I, I see that happening in the corner of my eyes. Uh, Frost's back and his veins feel like barbed wire. Satan replaced them with barbed wire. Oof. Not it rained today and I didn't work at it. Okay, I assumed that, um, I assumed that, uh, he was working at his forge. No, he's just dying. Don't die, Frost. That's Rest not Rest in good. peace to the homie. Pour out some amniotic ballast for the homie. Ew! <laughs> you want some coke heartthrob for those pains? Oh god, no. Alright, read Crystal. <clears throat> 2.2.0 Permian Basin Superorganism Background. The Permian Basin Super... The Permian Basin Superorganism Manus Colossus also known by the popular nomenclature uh, no, no, nomenclature 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 thank you both of you the nomenclature of mystery flesh pit is a subterranean organism unique to modern biology being the sole occupant of the phylum 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 phylum, phylum. Manicua? i don't know <laughs> <laughs> the organism was discovered by a pilot well a pilot well the organism was discovered by a pilot well drilling crew in 1973 later efforts were made to expose more of the organism through drilling and surface mining explosives the superorganism is chiefly characterized by its immense size which is still a matter of geobiological debate surveys suggest that the organism may span many hundreds of miles beneath the permian basin horizontally with scientists speculating that the organism organism may extend vertically into the upper mantle of the earth's interior the complete anatomical layout and internal organization of the organism is unknown. Tissue samples suggest that the organism contains gastrointestinal, vascular, respiratory, musculoskeletal, nervous, limbic, and 
integumentary systems with remarkable and similarly mm. integumentary yep that uh, to mammal life while also containing a variety of systems which have no direct analog and are not fully understood the feeding cycle of the organism is poorly understood and believed to occur on a complex and long-term schedule of dormancy and feeding activity it has been hypothesized that the superorganism derives caloric in energy from subterranean hydrocarbon deposits through the organ though the organism has been observed to digest and absorb organic matter the depth at which the organism extends into the surrounding rock strata indicates that the organism is several hundred thousand years old. It is unknown what the natural lifespan of the species is, or if the Permian Basin superorganism represents a mature uh, or developing example of the species. So then we hit 3.0.0. This is the actual incident timeline. So, start of relevant timeline. 10.29 a.m. July 4th. Unseasonably high rains force park administrators to cancel a July 4th concert and fireworks display scheduled to take place on the surface park grounds. Many visitors who had already purchased tickets to the event become upset and a decision is made to extend the park's hours until midnight for those who had purchased event tickets. 8 p.m. July 4th. Normal closing time for the National Park. A typical shift change of reduced night staff at the control room takes place. 9.16 p.m. July 4th. Harvesting crews working in the western extremities of the organism set a new extraction record to meet a quota for bonuses in time for the holiday weekend. 9.30 p.m. July 4th. Control room operators initiate a routine system self-test to, to discover and discover a relay fault error resulting from increased electrical demand from mining equipment and tourist infrastructure. A control room operator logs the fault and notifies the on-duty engineer. 9.41 p.m. July 4th. Uh, water drainage from surface rain into the entry orifice begins to collect in the sand gullet. Drainage pumps are automatically activated by a sensor system but fail to initialize due to the relay fault. An emergency backup pump running the separate emergency system is automatically activated. 9.42 p.m. July 4th. A critical alarm at the control room alerts operators that the emergency water pump has seized and is inoperative. Under lubrication of the pump's impeller brushes resulted in corrosion due to the moist interior of the flesh pit environment. Yikes. Yep, 9.48 p.m., July 4th. Technicians arrive at the primary pump station to discover the sand gullet almost completely submerged. Water begins to pour over the dorsal respiratory ridge into the bronchial bulbules. Control... <laughs> <laughs> it is Sorry, a funny... It's a funny you know, word. It's, it's a funny word, yeah. <laughs> Control room operators divert power to hydraulic stent rams to brace for expected choke response. 9.51 p.m., July 4th. Technicians, technicians a repair. Oui. Technicians do a heckin' repair <laughs> <laughs> on the delay fault as control staff reset the park's electrical grid. The grid is offline for 45 seconds. The automatic PA system does not notify guests that the system is scheduled to automatically shut down at the normal 8 p.m. closing time. The temporary lapse of lighting causes many guests to become panicked and return to the main gantry lift at the lower visitor center. 9.52 p.m. July 4th. A choking action from the organism begins 31 seconds into the electrical reset. The main dorsal trunk violently flexes. Lack of power to hydraulic arming ramps causes irreparable damage to several sections of internal infrastructure. So, to make a long story short, and to, and to desanitize this a little bit, essentially, it rained really hard, and the water pumps that keep the water from collecting in the sand gullet, which goes into the breathing apparatus of the organism, failed. So, mm -hmm. water poured into the lungs, and it just went... <laughs> and that broke e and that broke everything it lightly coughed and all of the 30 years of work that went into the pit gone that's it broken yes. so um 
9.53 p.m., July 4th, as the electrical system finishes the reboot cycle, the dynamic hydraulic actuator supporting the lower visitor center overcorrect for stability, not accounting for the shift in the wall lining of the new of the nexial cavity in which the visitor center facility is anchored. Two of the six structural supports are torn from their foundations, which causes the facility to list 20 degrees off vertical. The base joint of the vertical entry gantry is bent beyond its design limit angle. Oh. 9.54 p.m. July 4th. The master alarm is tripped automatically. Surface facilities are notified as response teams are given an order to mobilize. The order to mobilize. 9.56 p.m. July 4th. Park rangers are dispatched to rescue groups of visitors trapped in partially collapsed tunnels and trails. 10.03 p.m. July 4th. Continued movement of the organism combined with rainwater causes one of the upper entry gantry supports to slip. An outbound elevator conducts an emergency stop straining over, stranding over two dozen visitors. 10.05 oh. p.m. July 4th. Tremors registered as far away as the DFW Metroplex. 10.06 p.m. July 4th. Solo, soil liquefaction soil liquefaction destabilizes surface facilities in and around the organism. Dilation anchors begin retracting to keep the entry orifice open. A 10.12 p.m. So essentially this thing coughed and tried to close its mouth. Mm-hmm. 10.12 p.m. July 4th. A master failsafe is activated by the automatic park management system 20,000 liters of aconitite compound are ejected into the superorganism via a distributed network of relay stations located throughout its known internal anatomy essentially this they were like oh shit this thing is waking up injected with drugs to make it go to sleep makes sense 10 12 p.m july 4th tremors and convulsions intensify as the entry gantry connection to the lower visitor center detaches completely the lower visitor center begins to collapse downward into the nexial cavity oh no 10 12 p.m july 4th peristolic muscle action of the nexial cavity begins to exert substantial pressure on the outer structure of the lower visitor visitor center facility 10.15 p.m. July 4th. The prime la laboid, laboid uh, junction just west of the Septum Falls geobiological feature flexes into an open position, releasing a torrent of lactogastric chyma into the dorsal trunk. This is likely a, as a reaction to the econ econotine uh, injection. Essentially, it's starting to vomit because it's not used to drugs in its system. Makes sense. 10.16 p.m. Peristolic spasms force the caustic chyma slurry through a nexial cavity and Whoa. up through the lower and upper moisture crops towards the surface orifice. 10.16 p.m. July 4th. Many guests attempting to flee the stalled elevator near the entry orifice attempt climbing out the upper moisture crop but are ultimately unsuccessful due to torrential rains causing the surface to become very slippery. Many end up falling back into the maw. Oh, that'd be so scary. Yeah. 10.17 p.m. July 4th. The chyma slurry erupts from the surface orifice in a geyser Ooh. several hundred meters in Ew. height. Large pieces of undigested organic matter crush several vehicles and damage windows. Oh. 10.19 p.m. July 4th. Following the several minute long ejecta event, a deep and incredibly loud roar erupts from the entry orifice as ground tremors intensify further. Large extremities began surfacing through bedrock and soil approximately 30 kilometers from the century orifice. It's 30 kilometers to 120 kilometers from the entry orifice, rather. Oh, so it has arms. It has arms that it's broken through the surface, yes. 10.25 p.m., July 4th. The acrid smell of the gastric ejecta can be de detected as far as Odessa, Texas. 
1026 p.m. July 4th, two Park Service vehicles and a tour vehicle containing Park Service employees and several guests attempt to ascend through the entry orifice tube. 1027 p.m. July 4th, parastolic actions crushes one of the tour vehicles and sucks the other two vehicles back into the nexial cavity and down into a digestive organ. These vehicles are presumed destroyed. Oh no. Yep, so it, 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 a little bit of water got into its lungs, and mm. uh, it coughed and crushed everything. Mm. And yes, it has limbs. <sighs> Giant Cthulhu of the ground. Yep. 10.58 p.m., July 4th. The Pentagon is given authorization from the White House to use nuclear force if oh, necessary God. to prevent the organism from entering an active and or ambulatory state. 10.02 10 p.m. July 4th. Or 11.02 p.m. rather. 11.02 p.m. July 4th. The on-site operations director within the lower visitor center control room initiates a final fail-safe measure in the form of the contingency measure. 11.02 p.m. July 4th. Master event log records successful spin-up of the contingency measure. 11.05 p.m. July 4th. Lower Visitor Center structural integrity is critically compromised, resulting in total collapse. 11.05 p.m. July 4th. Data connection with Lower Visitor Center is severed. 11.13 p.m. July 4th. Spasms and motor actions of the superorganism begin to noticeably subside. Response teams begin to descend into the surface orifice and attempt to rescue op to attempt rescue operations. 11.19 p.m., July 4th. Response team encounters via visitor group which had attempted escape from stalled elevator. Most are dead. The remainder are mortally wounded and partially digested due to gastric to due uh. to caustic gastric ejecta. 11.42 p.m., July 4th. O uh, radio contact established with ranger vehicle trapped within Oyster's shame. Due to ve ve la ventricle closure, no feasible rescue strategy can be developed before complete mastication occurs. They're going to get chewed to death, in other words. 11.56 p.m., July 4th. Response team confirms that contingency measure and associated facility and associated facility are still intact and operating. 11.58 p.m., July 4th. Texas Governor Rick Perry formally de declares a state of emergency for Gumption County. Let me just read chat real quick. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a wad of beef. No, it isn't. I hope you get to see what it looks like if it comes out of the ground completely. We'll see. If that happens. It 12th. just looks like um, the what was the uh, calamity Ganon? <laughs> oh, <laughs> just looks yeah. like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, do you want to read from eleven twenty two and onward? Sure, I can. All right. All right. Uh, wait, you mean eleven forty two? Uh sorry. Uh, twelve twenty two. Sorry. Oh, twelve twenty two. Okay, no, no, you're good. All right. <clears throat> 12.22 a.m. July 5th, response team's root data slash power umbilical, umbilical. To, new ba uh, to new base camp is contingency measure facility. 12.35 a.m. July 5th, three interpit life forms are identified as having been ejected in onto the surface. 15 visitors are injured and seven are hunted by interpit life forms during panicked evacuation of surface resort. 12.41 a.m. July 5th, park staff managed to kill the three large life forms. 1.02 a.m. July 5th, National Guard helicopters be begin delivering supplies and personnel to aid in the site containment. 1.58 a.m. July 5th, field hospital is constructed to care for wounded visitors and staff. 2.37 a.m. July 5th, initial damage surveys report catastrophic destruction of internal park infrastructure. Pit geobio geobiology has dramatically changed in hazard level. 3 a.m. July 5th, emergency teleconference with Anodyne executive leadership. National Parks Director and Secretary of the Interior are present. 3.12 a.m. July 5th, executive decision is made to initiate FEMA response and assemble a task force for containing superorganism. 
4 a.m. July 5th, media helicopters and vehicles begin to report on the scope of the, dis of the disaster. 4.39 a.m. July 5th, base camp technicians begin to spin down contingency measure. Large fr fractures due to inertial stress have appeared on mineral com components. Engineers advise against reinitiating contingency measure until mineral components can be replaced or repaired. 6.08 a.m. July 5th, ground personnel begin assembling a pump system to inject industrial sedatives into superorganism. Transport trucks containing industrial sedative arrive. 9.45 a.m. July 5th, emergency teleconference of anodyne shareholders. <laughs> <laughs> 11 20 a.m why is that funny <laughs> Just, it took them that long to have an emergency teleconference oh yeah shit you right 45 the next you're right. day to have an emergency teleconference you right you right carry and on also, also in addition to that like damn you better bail right now <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, 11 1120 uh, the, the, the conference was of two people because all the rest already sold their shares Damn. 20 a.m. July 5th, several injured visitors inexplicably leave Field Hospital and begin walking towards open pit orifice. Approximately 38 individuals are able to crawl back into the orifice over the course of eight hours. None are recovered. There you go, but Pat. There you go. Does this thing enthrall? Yes. There you go. There's your answer. 3.51 p.m. July 5th, radio transmission from trapped ranger vehicle ceases. Many speculate that other small groups of visitor and staff are still trapped. End of relevant timeline. Four, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. 4.0.0, final investigation report. The following final investigation report addresses additional investigation findings not covered in the previous report, including analysis of one, the anodyne organization, emergency response and safety culture, two, industrial disaster response standards, three, structural integrity standards, and four, effective performance of mystic contingency measures. Would you like me to continue? Uh, 4.1.0, technical findings. This report highlights... I can take it. <laughs> okay. This report highlights the following technical findings. An in-depth discussion appears in the interim report. 4.1.1. The electrical distribution scheme for the interior operations of the Permian Basin Superorganism Nature Preserve was modeled on the typical supply load grid layout often found in mines, with power provided by gas-fired plant by a gas-fired gas-fired plant, Jesus, located within the surface support compound. Unlike typical mining power distribution networks, the power load was split uh, with the mining facilities. What was split with the facilities involved in the tourism and natural preservation operations within the organism. This split demand yielded a load fluctuating from 30, 33 kV kilovolts, 33 kilovolts to 60 kilovolts, uh, depending on a range of factors from resource extraction output, visitor throughput, hydrostatistic, and bar barometric. Uh, fluctuations within the organism and the ambient blood pressure of the organism. This unorthodox load distribution scheme required careful demand oversight and was subject to failure if operated outside of design load specifications. Such a failure occurred on July 4th, 2007 was when operators increased electrical demand beyond design load specifications by both extending resource extraction operations while simultaneously increasing visitor visitor throughput loads on trail infrastructures. Then we have a cross section through Sand Gola and Respiratory Ridge. So essentially here are the drainage pumps which are supposed to activate. See water comes down here and it collects inside of the sand pit. And uh, there's the drainage pump station, which is supposed to drain the water and pump it back up to the surface, or uh, that's it. Mm -hmm. uh, but water kept filling up, and it went over to the dorsal respiratory ridge right here, and it went over the spillway. So then... Uh, oh, okay, and then there's the epiglottal closure muscle secured with retention frames. 
Uh, so then if water hits this area, uh, there's supposed to be an emergency drainage pump, which pumps the water away. But both this failed and this failed. So water ended up pooling in these ridges and then going down into the bronchial bubules, which then caused it to cough. And once it coughed, that's when everything went kaflooey. Mm. 4.1.2 Hydrochloric corrosion is common in geobiological resource extraction where naturally occurring hydrochloric compounds react with steel equipment. Process variables that affect corrosion rates include the total hydrochloric content of the enzyme secretions, flow conditions, application of Tums. <laughs> Just giant Tums. No. Application of Tums, industrial organic corrosion inhibitor self, Oh, wait, it is Tums! <laughs> I was kidding, it is Tums! Tums Industrial Organic Corrosion Inhibitor Salve and the System Temperature and Humidity. Virtually all geobiological operations equipment is subject to this type of corrosion and requires routine inspections and prevention maintenance to ensure that metas uh, metallic and non-metallic corrosion-prone surfaces are operating at design strength. The investigation has concluded that the corrosion found within the primary impeller brushings within the emergency drainage pumps was caused by hydrochloric corrosion due to poor maintenance. 4.1.3 Foundations and other anchor support structures within the Permian Basin superorganism are critical components of park infrastructure, which require careful planning and construction oversight. Under nominal conditions, uh, anchor sites are selected by engineers to meet design load specifications with consultation from Vantario biologists for minimum anatomical disturbance. Rigid geobiological strata such as bone and dense cartilage are most often selected for load-bearing anchor points for their relative stability and uh, similarly conventional load-bearing strata such as rock. However, many locations within the Permian Basin superorganism are primarily characterized by dense compositions of soft tissues requiring novel anchoring solutions. Several anchors within the primary entry tube utilize a cleat-based stent system, which engages the entry tube muscle walls. These forces are equalized by the use of circular retention trusses, which, when combined with vibration dampening actuators, form a rigid support assembly upon which fixed components, such as entry gantry, may be affixed. Peristaltic action of a muscle tube has the potential to rotate a circular cleat stent frame by up to 90 degrees, eliminating the retaining capabilities of the frame. It is for this reason that design specification standards call for the installation of either rigid or tensile support members between consecutive retaining frames. In cases such as within the entry tube, tensile cables were selected to provide the support. These cables are subject to corrosion and must be routinely inspected in order to ensure that they meet minimum design load specifications. The in investigation has concluded that the cables installed in the entry tube retaining frame systems were improperly maintained and failed due to corrosive weakening of the cable members. So, in other words, they didn't maintain their shit. Yikes. So, as you can see here in these diagrams, um, this is what it's supposed to normally look like. Uh, this is the, uh, the visitor sensor within the nexial cavity. I don't know why I'm pointing at the screen. You can't see what I'm doing. <laughs> uh, this is the visitor center, and these are the uh, the cavities. Uh, these are the cables that keep it above the nexial cavity. But when it flexed, it closed down, it broke all these connections, and then the visitor center is like this. With all the people trapped inside going thump down into it. Jeez. 4.1.4. Go, Crystal. <laughs> the use of previously untested contingency measures by operators, while not the primary inciting incident of the disaster, is a prime contributor to the outstanding, outstanding collateral damage. A network of sensor stations embedded throughout the Permian Basin superorganism had acted as a distributed sensory system intended by park planners to provide a method for observing large-scale changes to the organism's condition. 
as an experimental contingency measure, each station was outfitted with a mechanism capable of injecting up to 15 liters of a concentrated aconitine solution. Aconitine oh, yeah, is- that's the, uh, yeah, oh, aconitine, oh. yes. Go on. Okay. Aconitine is commonly used as an acute toxin for large mammals such as whales and was chosen for its theoretical effectiveness on key muscle groups within the organism. Park planners were under the assumption that a rapid injection of large volumes of aconitine would act as a sedative agent without inducing tissue death beyond the immediate injection sites. The investigation was concluded that this injection's fail-safe was directly responsible for escalating the motor response of the organism to levels beyond the design load strength of the critical park infrastructure. The investigation has also concluded that the aconitine injection fail-safe was directly responsible for causing the toxic shock response within the organism, which resulted in a gastric ejecta event. And this is an overview of the uh, redacted contingency measure. So let's take a look at this. We have a structural grounding frame, frame, central power, and relic fluid reservoir. Relic fluid reservoir, huh? Harmonic actuator array, three axis hydro, uh, hydraulic harness, redacted, aka mineral component three, and main turntable. So, do you remember the, uh, that, uh, the indigenous, uh, people's tale about the dragon being trapped under the ground? Mm. There was a ritual that was, uh, tied to that. Like, it was a ritual to, uh, keep the beast sated, I guess you could say. Um, it seems that this relic was discovered, and, uh, maybe that is the contingency plan. Oh. So we don't know. The contingency measure is hypothesized to function by utilizing a series of standing harmonic and ultrasonic wavelengths, which have been observed to affect the overall behavior of the Permian Basin superorganism. These waves are created by applying a 15 megahertz... Uh, mechanical percussion to the face of an excavated large quartz crystal known as mystic artifacts number 15 number 21 and number 22 once struck the unique properties of the relic propagate the wave outward and into the surrounding anatomy of the permian basin organism when placed upon a rapidly rotating turntable the effects can be multiplied and oriented allowing a high degree of theoretical influence over the organism this contingency measure was activated only once and demonstrated the potential application this technology may have in future containment measures however at the time of this investigation no additional relics have been located intact without this key assembly component the cgr does not recommend additional experimental use of the contingency measure So that's interesting. Mm -hmm. 4.2.0 Organizational Findings and uh, 4.2.1 Anodyne did not effectively implement internal recommendations to help prevent structural failures to hydrochloric corrosion. In the eight years prior to the incident, a small number of anodyne personnel with knowledge and understanding of enterobiology biology recommended on several occasions either a one-time inspection of every component within the primary interpark infrastructure system, known as a 100% component inspection, or an upgrade to the material of construction of these key infrastructure components components. The recommendations were not implemented effectively, and many key structural and mechanical components maintained remained in service until failure on July 4th of 2007. 4.2.2. Anodynes failed to perform internally recommended 100% component inspections. Anodyne metallurgists uh, released a formal report dating September 30th of 2004, nearly three years before the incident, titled Updated Inspection Strategies for Preventing Hydrochloric Corrosion Failures in Critical Systems. The investigation was concluded that these recommendations were not properly implemented. Listen to your fucking engineers, corporations. <laughs> yeah. 4.2.3. The CGR identified several contributing causes to the July 5th, 2007 incident relating to the safety culture at Anodyne. 
decision making that encouraged continued operation of tourism and resource extraction operations despite hazardous working conditions. Reluctance among employees to use their stop work authority. Uh, recent safety culture surveys performed within research extraction sites resource extraction sites indicate that employees had become less willing to use their stop work authority between 2003 and 2006 and substandard equipment maintenance practices. Those same surveys indicate that anodyne employees saw increased problems with how the internal operations infrastructure maintained its equipment between 2003 and 2006. 4.2.4 Anodyne did not effectively identify on the incident command structure the damage mechanisms that could be that could have caused the failures on the night of the incident. The OSHA hazard uh, operations and emergency response has OPER uh, standard states that the incident commander shall identify to the extent possible all hazardous conditions present. In an emergency response situation, however. In an, in an emergency response situation. However, the appropriate technical expertise necessary for identification was not effectively consulted in the incident command structure on July 5th of 2007. This lack of knowledge of all potential causes of the incident led the incident commander to direct emergency responders to take actions that may have ultimately exacerbated the hazard condition and may have put many park visitor but park service personnel, anodyne personnel, as well as civilian visitors in harm's way. It also led the incident commander to limit it, to limit the hazard zone to a small area that did not consider the possibility of a gastric ejecta event. When the gastric ejecta event occurred, personnel and equipment E emergency equipment positioned in the safety zones were engulfed in the volume of caustic ejecta. 5.1.0 Incident Conclusions Go ahead, Crystal. 5.1.1 The CGR found that the failure of this incident is indicative of a fragmented hazard management approach that has placed the responsibility to implement safety recommendations on stakeholders which stood to benefit from decreased oversight while also incurring financial loss for any safety oversight restrictions replaced. Consequences of this cultural attitude surrounding the tourism and resource extraction operations within the Permian Basin superorganism led to the severe underestimation of the capabilities of the organism as well as the capabilities of the systems designed to limit the hazards posed by the organism. 5.1.2, the use of concentrated aconitine without prior study or approval as this failsafe directly triggered a reactionary response from the organism, which led to the deaths of over 750 individuals. The use of the contingency measure, while effective at pacifying the organism, was simply employed without, similarly employed without prior substantial testing or approval. The lack, this lack of communication from anodyne regarding the specific theory of operation and even existence of the artifacts, which are essential components within the contingency measure, directly led to the unsafe high RPM operation, which fractured the mineral components of the contingency measure. measure. <clears throat> 5.2.0, general recommendations. 5.2.1, the CGR with full support from the US Department of the Interior, the US Geological Survey, the National Park Service, and made has made the discretionary recommendation to not pursue additional commercial development within or adjacent to the boundaries of the Permian Basin superorganism. 5.2.2. In the interest of continuing the present containment operations while also, also ensuring readiness in the event of a future geobiological action event, the CGR has developed a comprehensive, pre comprehensive program of monitoring and containment. This program is divided into a series of objectives intended to better mitigate the hazard presented by the ex existence of the Permian Basin superorganism. 5.2.3 Improve the communication of geobiological hazard science for use in decision and policy making. 1. Support the use of geobiological hazard science and re risk reduction with engineering, environmental science, spiritual, and social sciences. 2. Improve understanding among venter interior biologists, engineers, and other numerical simulation of organism ground activity, as opposed to the use of empirical ground motion prediction equations. Three, improve understanding of the benefits of early warning systems. 
Four, educate about organism movement patterns and operational activity forecasts. 5.2.4, advance basic knowledge of geobiological action event hazards and inform actions to reduce the risk of organism becoming non-dormant. One, develop a new method to estimate stimulus response outcomes and interactions with the Permian Basin superorganism without reliance on expert opinion, proprietary computer models, or wholly mystic ritual methods without demonstrated patterns of reliability. Two, educate and facilitate facilitate local containment capabilities to deal with fauna and other life forms which are native to the organism's interior anatomy. Three, develop methods for production and administration of appropriate sedative measures to chemically induce a comatose state of inactivity in the organism. Four, where it is absolutely necessary for personnel to descend into the organism, develop methods to reduce the possibility of individuals becoming trapped. Five, establish a perimeter area surrounding the incident site to protect the health and safety of the public from additional fauna incursions or ejecta events. 5.3.0, containment recommendations. 5.3.1, a thorough plan for containment of the organism has been devised by a joint containment task force comprised of geobiologists, venteriobiologists, seismologists, medical experts, uh... Engineers from various disciplines, land management specialists, ecclesiastical personnel, e no, ecclesiastical, I learned that word earlier, ecclesiastical personnel, as well as rep representatives from private industry. This proposed containment procedure integrates a variety of strategies intended to prolong the dormancy of the Permian Basin superorganism while simultaneously reducing the likelihood of a future geobiological action event. And there is a diagram for this. We <laughs> love our diagrams. Yeah, I love my I love these diagrams that I do not fucking understand. <laughs> this one looks like something that a kid would have whipped up in middle school, like at one AM whenever their science project was due that next day. <laughs> Sometimes simplicity is the most effective. I don't understand this, so we're just gonna move on. <laughs> this this author is a little too Crichton from my from my understanding. He's over my head. <laughs> the task force has recommended the establishment of a three kilometer restricted access zone surrounding the entry orifice, defined by a reinforced and patrolled barrier. Signs and other warning devices should be installed to clearly inform the public of the hazards presented by the containment operations and the superorganism itself. Where possible, the task force has recommended that any material necessary for the containment operations be produced on site so as to minimize logistic dependency on remote facility. And now we have a diagram intended for illustration purposes only and not to scale. We have the Permian Basin and Superorganism Containment Program Overview. That's a lot of layers. That's the whole good. Just have layers. <laughs> Holy fuck. It's the Xbox Series X made flesh. <laughs> Ew. Oh my god. Imagine you're just casually sipping, having a cup of tea, and this fucking thing lives under you. <gasps> no thanks. This shit's like aperture science, but flesh. Blech. Oh my god. Oh my god, it's like a fucked up cake. Yeah, it really is. The recommended multi-strategy containment plan is outlined as follows. 1. All efforts should be made to maintain a steady introduction of high-potency anesthetic to the uppermost dermal anatomy of the organism. This is the foremost measure for reducing the capability of the superorganism to sense and perceive human activity. 2. At a similar volume to high potency anesthetics, the introduction of inorganic phosphates directly into muscles of the superorganism is an essential strategy designed to delay the and fatigue of the motor response of the organism. 3. Where possible, the introduction of acidic compounds into bone structures will further weaken the overall response capability of the superorganism in the event that other containment precautions fail. Special care should be taken to ensure that primary structural members of the organism's skeletal system are not weakened. However, as such a measure could potentially damage critical infrastructure. Uh, 
Note, as a as of Rev 18.3 of this document, a review, revisions. As of revision 18.3 of this document, the Permian Basin Recovery and Superorganism Containment Corporation has been granted a temporary permit for the continued extraction of bone material and amniotic fluid ballast for research and limited commercial purposes. So they're still trying to make products from this ballast, man. Gross. Four. The task force has recommended measures which would induce a state of mild hypoxia with the superorganism through the replacement of oxygen-rich air with carbon dioxide-rich air with the rep within the respiratory system of the organism. In addition, by venting plant exhaust from the surface containment facility... Uh, directly into the organism, this plan remains in compliance with standing EPA regulations on emissions within natural preserves. <laughs> hey, all of your emissions, <laughs> just pump it directly into the soup organism. It'll it's fine. fine. It'll be fine. It's fine. Nothing went wrong before. This will be fine. Actually, actually, nothing did go wrong before. People smoked cigarettes and all that shit in there and nothing happened. They ran diesel engines in it. It was fine. As far as I know, maybe in the lungs they, they were giving it cancer. That's oh, why no. it was so angry. Oh no, the earth has cancer. Oh god. The extraction of five. The extraction of nutrient rich material from within the superorganism gastric system is an additional preservative step recommended by the staff force to weaken the response capability of the organism in order to prevent the hu a hunger response. The task force has recommended displacing the volume of nutrient-rich material with that of an inert material such as gravel or rock. Note, as of revision 2.5 of this document, materials and objects harvested from the retrocognitive material gestation organs, aka gift gardens, will continue at a greatly reduced capacity for the exclusive purposes of research. All of the objects shall be stored in a designated and secure off-site facility. All right, Crystal, if you want to cap the, off this fucking adventure, go ahead. <laughs> sure. 6.0.0 Conclusion The CGR concludes its recommendations and report with broad advocacy for any such programs which aim to better prepare physical as well as social and spiritual infrastructure for the inevitability the inevitability of the Permian Basin superorganism emerging from dormancy and becoming completely active and ambulatory. The measures and methods described within these recommendations are temporary in their effectiveness, while representing the fullest extent of human capability to impact the Permian Basin superorganism. Future studies and capabilities may yield a greater degree of readiness in matters concerning the survivability of a societal encounter with an active and ambulatory Amanus Colossus but it is unrealistic to believe that mankind will be able to seriously damage or eliminate such an organism. Inhabitants of the Western Hemisphere within the U.S. and abroad must come to understand the losses each and every one of us will face and how those impacts will harm the quality of life we enjoy in this unique part of the world. End of document. This document represents an executive overview of the now infamous July 2007 disaster, which permanently closed the Mystery Flesh Pit National Park. Though this initial hazard and containment response was praised by many for its quick and decisive action, many have criticized the government for continuing to allow the Permian Basin Recovery and Superorganism Containment Corporation, formerly Anodyne Inc., a commercial stake in the containment efforts. More info about this project can be found at the subreddit r slash so professional. More info about this project can be found at the subreddit r slash flesh pit national park. The official Discord or at the blog mysteryfleshpit.tumblr.com. There you go. So that, my friends, is the entirety of the Mystery Flesh Pit, and now you know what went wrong. Now you know why it shut down, and the reason why it shut down is because the creature coughed and moved the limb a little bit. Oh my god. It with this the last stream was like three out like three and a half hours and this one is almost four hours. This took <laughs> so long to read through. Well, like the last hour was just this. Yeah, the last hour was just that. But this was a very important part. So uh, is there 
is there information about what anodyne not anodyne is doing at this moment um, it's I close think to the public, I th but it's not close to anodyne. I think in the two and uh, Q and A zero zero three they do cover that. Let me see. Uh, okay. So we have one last thing to read, and I'll go ahead and read it. And I just want to okay. say thank you to everyone who has stuck with this, because this has been a very long reading, but this is genuinely like one of the coolest worlds that I have ever seen written. Like, seriously, I am 100% sold on the idea of the mystery flesh pit. This is such a cool concept. And I, I don't want to see it end here. I want to see more of this concept. Because this is this is just... It's, it's incredibly written. It's very well done. It's very Crichtonous, like Michael Crichton. It's very Crichtonous in its level of meticulous detail that it describes things it's it's wonderful i haven't read something this scientifically in depth since like the lost world which is a Crichton novel or uh, like the andromeda strain or like even jurassic park it's this is seriously very well written um the creator of this robert uh you've done a fantastic job this is a wonderful world you've created i don't want to see it end here i want to see more of this Give us more mystery. Give us more pit. <laughs> yeah, give us more of the flesh pit. All right. See, I was going to say, give us more flesh, and I was like, oh, no, that's not. <laughs> Show us some skin. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, in the incident report, you mentioned extremities servicing near the orifice. Can you elaborate on what the limbs looked like? The event was very traumatic to the people living in and around Central West Texas and was documented in a variety of ways. Of particular merit is the painting entitled Limbs Rising Near Midlands from 2015, which depicts a striking portrayal of one of the limb extremities of the superorganism emerging during the early morning of July 5th of 2007. While the event happened at night, the skill and destruction captured in the painting is reflective of the tragedy as felt by those who lived through it. So there you go. There's just this pristine, this pristine countryside, and then bam, this giant fucking limb coming out Whoa. of the uh, the earth. Is it like a tentacle? It kind. Is it like a tentacle? It kind of looks like a tentacle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is it, Mommy, it is it like a tentacle? <laughs> I don't know why I said it that way. <laughs> <laughs> is it like a tentacle? Oh, that's how it was funny. It kind of looks like a fin. It kind of does, yeah. Oh, oh, what if it's a giant whale, like a land whale? Well, um, in that uh, in that indigenous oh, story, they said it was a dragon. <gasps> what if it's a yeah. wing? What if it's a wing that tip? Could be a wing. That would make oh. a lot more sense. Oh no! I was no. thinking about it. I was like, it wouldn't have lungs. It wouldn't drown with water if it was amphibian. <laughs> well, whales have lungs. Oh, that's true. They have to come up and breathe. Yeah. <laughs> Get nanade, fool. <laughs> you're right. You're right. When you're right, you're right. <laughs> oh, okay. So, um, uh, we read this last time. Um,. Of if uh, if meat carved from the living flesh itself was like cooked and like served and they already uh, we read that last time no. What kind of information do we have about pre-Columbian ritual practices centered around the MFP? Was any of the research able to continue post-containment? The extent of the knowledge of the pre-Columbian culture's rel relation to the pit is heavily based on a few public avail pub on few on the few Jesus publicly available records of the ruins adjacent to the entry orifice. From what we know, there was definitely an advanced awareness of the superorganism among local and other ancient cultures. How this awareness manifested is unknown. Some scholars speculate that the pit may have been a focus of worship, possibly involving sacrificial offerings. No evidence of ancient cultures descending into the pit has ever been found, but this doesn't 
uh, definitively rule out pre-Columbian expeditions. The controversial discovery of early colonial Spanish armor within the sand gull, it seems to dispel the common notion that complex technology is required to descend at least that far into the pit. Oh, they found early colonial Spanish armor in the sand gull. Holy shit. Huh. I wonder, though, if that was like if they fell in rather than they actually went in intentionally. They, they probably fell in or were sacrificed in. Oh, good point. You said that some people were recovered from compound surface fauna. How many were successfully removed and are they still alive? Uh, we read this last time and it is just as horrific as the diagram suggests. It is unknown if uh, individuals are living or oh, still alive. Oh, I hate. Yeah. Is Anodyne still operational? The company. Anodyne was formally dissolved in 2009 following its, its bankruptcy filings, with its remaining debts and liquidation being managed by the reorganized Permian Basin Recovery Corporation. Though nebulous uh, political machinations, uh, the Permian Basin Recovery Corporation was awarded an exclusive and indefinite contract to oversee the management of the superorganism containment project. Today, today, the PBRC continues many of the same extraction operations that the Anodyne Corporation did before 2007. And then uh, there's the gas bowel, which is uh, this this horrible little thing right here. <laughs> We have showed this thing like a few times on the stream, and I love this thing. I don't know. It's horrifying, but I kind of love it. This poor little bastard only lives for a few minutes once it hatches out of its cocoon. It's so sad. It is sad. Gas bowels, suckling sprites, buggins. <laughs> That's what they're called, and <laughs> it's great. Oh, it has labored breathing, all oh, this poor thing. After the disaster, were the emergency phones still working? So could they be called or called from still? Yes. After the 2007 catastrophe, efforts were made to reestablish a communications network within the Mystery Flesh Pit, which included the many trail emergency phones, though the greater percentage of them have remained unused since 2007 and have likely been overtaken by growth. What are the stories behind some of the memorial sites found in the park, such as... Gaddy Circus Tragedy Memorial and the Fred J. Agnick uh, Memorial Dam. The Circus Gaddy Tragedy Memorial commemorates the 1976 tragedy from which the traveling entertainment group Circus Gaddy uh, was scheduled to perform a daring high wire stunt shown directly above the uh, then under reinforced entry orifice as part of a publicity stunt. During the performance, several chimp chimpanzees uh, which were scheduled to perform became panicked to the point of disrupting the ongoing routine by a troop of clown stunts uh, people while the soft flesh of the pit throw cushioned the performers fall an unexpected stretching of the moisture crops allowed them to slide down into the then unreinforced uh, area of the pit Rescue personnel were able to locate the performers inside the digestive sac a few hours later, but by that time, all 50 stunts people had already begun being digested by the pit. Ew. Rescue personnel cut them out, correctly suggesting that many were still alive. An experimental antacid spray was discharged on top of the gluey shrieking mound, but it was too late. Instead oh. of reducing the acidic effects of the partially digested bodies of the performers, the experimental compound flash calcified into the circus clown chymus formation as it appears on the trail today. The memorial was conducted in 1986 to commemorate the 10 year anniversary of their deaths. The Fred J. Anik. Uh, Agnick Memorial Dam was so named to commemorate the legacy of Texas statesman Fred D J. Agnick, a l vocal proponent of the Texas state parks. And there you go. With that, we have read absolutely everything there is to read about the Mystery Flesh Pit. Woo! There we, we go. Did it. We did it. We have done it. All is read. Huzzah! And uh, again, I just want to say this is genuinely like one of the best things that I have read. It is fantastic. 
And uh, like honestly, it's it's kind of like with the elements that have been laid out. I ca I agree with um, Wendagoon on this. The uh, the YouTuber I first discovered Mystery Flesh Pit from. I agree with Wendagoon on this that like all of the the staples for like a video game are like set in stone. Like it, it could take place after the 2007 disaster. And I'm going to switch over to just the face. So so um like it could take place after the 2007 disaster and you could be like a worker that has to go down into the pit to recover things and maybe something could go wrong that you get separated from your group and um there are already enemies in place like the macro bacteria and all of the big organisms uh, that you have to fight. There's like a whole survival horror game already in place. Hell, we even have like the save feature already in place. Those blue telephones. You can have those blue telephones be like a save feature in the game. True. And uh, I think that would be really fucking cool. I think that would be really cool. Um, and if not a video game, you know, like other sort of things. Like you can make a film out of this. Uh, you could make a novelization out of this, um, although maybe in the novelization would take away from like the, uh, like the uh, the visual diagrams that we get from this. But regardless, there's so much that you can do with the story. I would love to see more of it. Um, there has to be some sort of profit for the author that the author can make from this outside of merch. There has to be something. Um, I'm just I'm I'm floored. I love this. This is this is so fantastic. But that that remains that's that. It's been three hours or so. It's been like almost four hours and <laughs> my throat is shot. I have work tomorrow. Oh no. <laughs> I I don't work Damn. until I don't I don't work until four PM, so it's fine. Okay, well that's good, at least. Um but yeah, genuinely, this has been fantastic. And thank you everyone so much. Like, I've consistently been sitting at around like three or four viewers this entire time. And honestly, thank you so much for sticking with this. This is honestly such a good story. And I'm glad that I was able to share it with people. It was a weird one, but a good one. Yeah, absolutely. And it was perfect for Halloween. I agree. Wonderfully weird. So what's next for uh, the streams? Uh, uh, well, next. what's what what's 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 it? Uh, for uh, for my next stream, um, I since Craig uh, I'm Cranley no longer wishes to uh, stream because he wants to focus his full uh, efforts on learning 3D development and. Uh, you know, creating the video game that he's always wanted to create and whatnot. I've decided to take up the mantle of Thursday and Friday. Uh, and so with that, um, cool. the next thing I stream, uh, it may be medieval. I don't know. It's going to be some sort of Halloween sort of game. I could also make a Narcosis. That would be pretty cool. Uh, but that will be up to my discretion. Um, that being said, I work till closing tomorrow. So I don't know what exactly I'll do. Uh, maybe I, I might not stream tomorrow, but who knows? Because I do work till closing. But one thing that I do want to know is uh, I have pretty... I've effectively mastered uh, Metroid Dread to an extent. Like, I, I'm not... It's not going to do... It's not going to be like uh, games done quick. It's going to be like games done at a relatively fast pace. <laughs> <laughs> so, um... I do definitely want to stream Metroid Dread, but how, however, Pat is currently uh, experiencing Metroid Dread for the first time, so I don't want to ruin his experience, so I don't know what I'm going to do. Uh, but whatever it is, I will see you then. Thank you so much for watching. The person who joined me at the very end here is the lovely Ghosty Blue, twitch.tv slash Ghosty Blue. Um, oh, Captain, my Captain. Uh, she very graciously decided to join at the very end. You can catch her at twitch.tv slash ghostyblue, and you can catch her fiancé at twitch.tv slash codezombielive. Um, and he's in which been he's, lurking on the chat. He has been lurking <laughs> on the chat, and they are, uh, he is going to be playing Metroid Dread. Crystal, I don't know what the fuck she's doing. 
Uh, Saturday is my next stream, and I'm doing some more SCP. I'm going to attempt to try oh, to actually yeah. complete it. Yeah, attempt. SCP containment breach. How very appropriate, because the mystery flesh kit flesh pit could very well be an scp itself yeah. it's so well written it is the it is the scp of the entire facility the facility is just housed inside of it oh that would be terrible that would be awful it would, it would be although that would be the ultimate containment yeah i would like to see scp 173 claw its way out of that <laughs> or the uh, the crocodile one SCP six eight something rather I don't remember, but it's like let's see it crawl out of the mystery flesh pit. Oh Ooh. God! I mean, it would check out for why they had such weird creatures in the mystery flesh pit. Yeah. There's just SCPs playing. Uh, Fuck it! Just uh, relocate God. the entirety of the SCP Foundation. <laughs> let's put it inside there the pit. Go. There you go. Boom. All right, but uh, thank you so much for watching. All my information's over there. You can uh, go to jacobrusso.com to see all my various works in multimedia and whatnot. However, some unfortunate news with that is um, renewal for the website's coming up, and I'm not going to be able to afford it. So, unfortunately, this November, around November 10th, the website is going to be going down. Until I can afford it again, in which case it'll go back up, but uh, it will be down. Uh, I will keep the domain and whatnot, but in terms of operation, it will be gone. Um, so if you so want to see my work, good. get it while it's good. Get, get that eye candy while it's good. Uh, you can also <laughs> follow me on Twitter at RetroTechComs. Uh, the Patreon for the uh, the author of the Mystery Flesh Pit. That's not the Patreon, damn it. <laughs> oh, here it is. Um... The Patreon for the author of the wonderful Mystery Flesh Pit can be found here. Please go support them. And uh, the rest of my shit, uh, RetroTechComs on YouTube and RetroTechComs The Archives, which this will go up on later on. Thank you so much for watching. This is Jacob of RetroTech signing off. Have yourselves a fantastic spooky night and take care. Have you any final thoughts on this, Crystal? flesh pit's weird man the flesh pit is weird <laughs> and people drank shit from it like coca-cola Coca heartthrob like oh yes yeah, so let me have some turn me on right now juice like, you just imagine if people did that with it like other creatures other than milk because like milk is an exception that's excreted from the animal rather than like actually derived from the interior oh Oh god, you know what I just realized? There was the libido pit where it, it would usually you would go you would get horny in there because it turned mm -hmm. people on. People fucked in the flesh pit. Ah!